Carmen Rubio Show. <laughs> Today's episode is happening on Wednesday, July 20th, 2022. This is the afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good afternoon. Please call the roll. Good afternoon, Mayor. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Hard to see. Here. Max. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Wheeler. Here. Uh, and colleagues, uh, we moved the Portland Clean Energy Fund from the morning session to the afternoon session so we could give it a little more consideration. It will be after the item uh, that is actually scheduled for uh, this afternoon. Um, so we'll start with that, please. Item 656. Adopt the clean Climate Emergency Work Plan 2022 through 2025 as Portland's Climate Action Plan. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. It's an honor to bring this to council and to the public, um, the city's latest climate action plan. A very clear list of action items and responsible parties to do all we can as fast as we can to reduce our carbon emissions and be more resilient as we experience the effects of climate change. The plan you'll hear more about today states our carbon emissions reduction goals, describes the pathways to reach those goals, and also names the specific priority actions that we, City Council, must consider over the next three years. The plan represents broad collaboration across 11 bureaus and offices and the input of dozens of city staff. I am so grateful to all of the dedicated employees and the bureau directors who contributed time over the last few years. It is a clear, concise snapshot of where we are with respect to our goals what actions are most important to take, why it matters, and what it might cost the city. The plan rests on a foundation of community input, engagement, and involvement that went into our North Star policies, the Climate Emergency Declaration, the 100% Renewable Energy Resolution, and the 2035 Comprehensive Plan. Implementing these actions means partnering and deeply engaging with communities, nonprofit organizations, business, industry, labor, renters, and property owners, academia, and other agencies at all levels of government to wrestle with difficult policy choices, like what has helped or harmed by action or inaction? How do we remove barriers to collaboration? And how do we resource these changes that are needed for a just transition? The solutions will involve all of us, but the plan being presented to you today focuses intentionally on actions where city council has the agency and the authority to act. In addition, we know that the impacts of the climate crisis are not felt equitably. We're hearing more and more from frontline community members who are concerned about, the handling, about handling the impacts of climate change, like heat, wildfire smoke, and the lack of access to clean, cool air. We have heard and are responding to the urgent need to build climate resilience. That's why this work centers racial, social, and economic justice to shift power for des designing solutions to communities who have not historically been at the decision-making table and are often first impacted. For example, action B1 in the plan, the climate and health standard for existing buildings, is a direct result of engagement work that centers black and brown voices. You will be hearing more about this policy in the coming months. I want to highlight how much I appreciate this plan how this plan is laid out, actions that, action items that clearly listed, that are clearly listed with the relevant bureaus. All of this work can't be carried out by one bureau or one commissioner. So I look forward to the continued collaboration as all of these efforts move forward. I also want my colleagues to know that we are in, increasing the transparency and engagement into the city's climate progress. This city council voted in this budget to fund a position at BPS that will help establish a sustainability commission to increase climate accountability and accessibility for the public. And we are excited to get to work on this. Moreover, BPS recently invested resources into significantly improving the city's climate presence online, including a major website overhaul and, addition, and the addition of a dashboard of indicators related to climate progress. These dashboard capabilities will continue to be improved and refined over time. So thank you to all who have shaped this plan and to all who will assist in seeing this work through and getting us closer to our climate goals. So I'll now hand it off to Director Oliveira to, get us, to, get, to give us some more. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Council, good afternoon. Don Oliveira, BPS Director for the record. Uh, 
Council, I'm going to start with something a little different because when it comes to climate change, I can't help but start to reflect as, uh, as a parent on what we're experiencing uh, globally. So uh, as I want uh, to share with my family, my, my kids, uh, I'd like to read a little poem from a, a friend of mine, Drew Dellinger, uh, Hieroglyphic Stairway. It's 3.23 in the morning and I'm awake because my great-great-grandchildren won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren ask me in dreams, what did you do while the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? Surely you did something. When the season started failing, as that mammals, reptiles, birds were all dying, did you fill the streets with protest when democracy was stolen? What did you do once you knew? And I share that with you today as a preamble to say, we're sharing information that many of you have heard in different iterations and different plans from bureaus and our communities, your own commitments that you've directed us to take on. Because frankly, what we're experiencing as a city, as a nation, globally, is not new. What we've tried to do today in this work plan is to compile those actions in a way that's clear to understand how the city of Portland specifically has the capacity and the potential to take action on climate change. I want to be clear, oftentimes we hear naysayers speak up and say, well, the city of Portland, even if it met all its goals, we're not going to save global warming, we're not going to save the planet. Technically, that's accurate. What's missing in that narrative is the fact that we need leadership when leadership fails elsewhere. And as we watch the lack of leadership in different parts of our country, we see globally people stressing on how to respond to the climate crisis. I believe that Portland is incredibly positioned, both with our innovation, our entrepreneurial spirit, and frankly, your leadership and commitment to climate to actually take action. So the Climate Emergency Declaration was passed two years ago. This council actually dove in and said, we need to make, take action. We need to make a bold commitment to what it looks like to address the climate emergency. It's no longer a future state, it's upon us. And that emergency declaration was aspirational as a climate policy. It represented a year-long engagement with close to 50 organizations around the city focused on not just addressing our mitigation strategies, but addressing the impacts of climate change. I'd like to acknowledge Mayor Wheeler for his leadership in that moment and directing us to work with a broader range of, of community partners to ensure that the declaration was truly representative of our community, not just business sector, not just utility, but our, our frontline communities as well, youth as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. But as Commissioner Rubio noted, for the last couple of years, we've had an expired climate action plan and we've lacked the implementation plan for the declaration. So the Climate Emergency Work Plan today that we're sharing rectifies these things when adopted. It'll become the city's new climate action plan while also drilling down on those aspirational goals that the declaration laid out. I wanna also address the name. <laughs> There's a name change rooted in our experience working with our frontline communities following the process of our 2015 cap. That was the cap that sunset in 2020. In 2015, when that cap was adopted, it was internationally lauded, it was award-winning. It was the first in the world to integrate racial equity into the climate action planning process. And although we formed an equity working group to inform that cap, the truth is the, the process was pretty traditional in its planning process. And over time, we learned that after dozens of meetings and of reflection, we could be better, we can do better. So not only that, but our communities most impacted have been historically contributed far less to the problem, creating injustice at the top of an injustice system. So with this process, we're looking at identifying how we ensure that our communities most impacted are influence our, next, our next, um, next process. For the past seven years, BPS has engaged in attempt to do climate work the very different container. Commissioner Rubio mentioned the climate justice by design and bill shift as examples, and there, and there are many others. But that work doesn't absolve the city of, of the need to have a climate action plan. The city itself is responsible. And I think it's very interesting over the last few, few weeks as as the world has been heating up, as people have been experiencing this crisis, this council has been addressing climate in various ways. The fossil fuel uh, terminal zone amendment that you heard in June, we've been talking about the Portland Clean Energy Fund, and now we're talking about the climate emergency declaration today. All those have different levels of responsibility, but the truth is that right now, today, we're sharing with you the 43 actions that this council will have in front of you for the next three years and how you can help shape climate's, uh, Portland's climate future. So over the past six months, BPS led a process with 10 other bureaus and offices to collect and compile all the ongoing work that city bureaus um, are focused on related to climate, both decarbonization and resilience. Ideally, we'd like to, to have a much broader comprehensive story, but the fact is we think we've ca captured the 43 actions that are most, most prevalent, most necessary to take the, the needed steps to meet our 2030 and 2050 goals. 
The Climate Emergency Work Plan represents a focus and ideally City Council's leadership in dealing with the climate crisis. And taken together, these put us on the path to achieve the climate goals established in the Climate Emergency Declaration. The truth is you can sum up our climate agenda pretty simply. We need to use less energy in our buildings and the energy we do use, it needs to be greener. We need to ensure that our transportation systems allow for safe, active transit, safe, act, active personal transit, biking, walking, and if people are using personal cars, it's in, it's in green fuel vehicles. We need to invest in our urban, urban canopy. We need to ensure that our, our natural resources are resilient in investing in, in those systems. And in truth, we need to address our, our consumption and as we reduce our consumption, ensuring that we're investing in a circular economy. I summed it up really easy. But the truth is the actions to achieve that are much more complex and the decisions before you over the next coming years are gonna be very difficult. There are gonna be choices to make and investments to make that change the course of how we do business in Portland. But that's a good thing because as we change business, there's opportunities for economic development and wealth generation in our city. Not just for Portland, not just for the region, but to, to ensure that we are leading by example on what it looks like to transition to a circular economy that's investing in technologies that act not just serve, serve Portland, but serve our country and the globe. All the priorities in the work plan map to the Climate Emergency Declaration that this council passed two years ago, or the 100% renewable energy re resolution that passed years before that, the comprehensive plan or citywide system plans. In other words, you're looking at stuff that you've seen in different formats, again, compiled for you to understand what it looks like when the city of Portland once again steps forward and uh, leads with, on climate. I also want to acknowledge about process. It's really important that we understand that the science is very clear. The, the carbon pathways are also very clear for us. At this point, we'd like to get to work on developing the policies and the programs to meet our goals rather than get stuck in more planning and process. We're the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. We love plans. <laughs> I would ask that you consider that this plan be enough for us to embark on action to ensure that we can meet our goals and serve our communities. Uh, deck, please. Can we start the deck? Thank you. Next slide, please. So here it is, commissioners. This is our, this is our climate emergency work plan, reflective of, of the work that's been put in by city staff. Next slide, please. And it wasn't just BPS. I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the staff that contributed to this work. As I mentioned, 10 bureaus and offices came together to, to ensure that we were capturing the actions necessary to tell the story at this moment. I also want to acknowledge that this is a moment in time, and unlike a static report that we may release in different parts of the city, I want to acknowledge and encourage you all to appreciate that this is iterative. When new technologies, new programs, new opportunities present themselves, we want to be agile and respond to them. So while we're presenting this to you today with the work that these staff put into it, I also want to acknowledge that the work continues. And as we come back every year, as requested by the emergency declaration, we'll continue to provide feedback, updates, and hopefully successes. Climate action is upon us. Not just the crisis that we're experiencing, but the work we're doing. There are many actions and many processes that the city's already embarked on that are not included, in it. and that's not to acknowledge those, but just to point out that we're doing the work already, whether it be our, our fleets in the city, whether it be Bureau of Environmental Services, um, Renewable Nat Nat Natural Gas um, Capture Programs, excellent work. But this is the story of what happens next. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to BPS Climate Policy and Program Manager, Andrea Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, Donnie. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to share this work with you today. For the record, my name is Andrea Jacob, and I'm the Climate Policy and Program Manager for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I've been working on climate and energy policy and programs at BPS for the last 17 years. I have been part of the Bureau's climate action processes and team since the 2009 Climate Action Plan, and I'm very honored and excited to present the next iteration of this work on behalf of all of my colleagues at BPS and across the city who show up every single day with passion and persistence to restore a safe and healthy climate for us all. 
but especially for those who are, who are already on the front lines of a changing climate. As Johnny mentioned, when it comes to the climate science, and I'm sorry, um, next slide, please. <laughs> um, when it comes to the climate science, there are many things that we know for certain. The, the science and the research is irrefutable at this point, and the most concrete fact is that we are running out of time to make the changes required to prevent irreversible damage to the systems that support life on Earth. Those changes center around both decarbonization, taking carbon emissions out of the economy, and resilience, as Johnny mentioned. When I first started working on climate all those years ago, resilience and adaptation, those were really very much on the, on the back burner. We didn't focus on them. We focused very much on mitigation or decarbonization. But just in the span of my career, we have reached the point where we can't just plan for and invest in decarbonization. We need to focus on resilience with equal urgency because lack of action at the federal level and around the world have brought us to a place where resilience will not be achievable without deep emissions reductions. The Climate Emergency Work Plan addresses how we achieve those reductions, and the actions are the steps that we take to meet those goals, the 2030 and 2050 goals, and uphold the climate commitments that we have made on an international stage. Next slide, please. This graph shows our progress to date on reducing carbon emissions here locally in Portland. And while you can see that we've made some progress from 1990, which is our baseline, it's not nearly enough to meet the net zero emissions goal by 2050. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a plateauing instead of the steep decline that we need in order to achieve our net zero goal. And in fact, we have to reduce carbon emissions 50% in the next eight years, or in other words, another 30% of where, from where we are today. And the science makes it very clear that our window to act is closing. So when Council adopted the Climate Emergency Declaration in 2020, it did update our carbon reduction goals, and it made our 2015 Climate Action Plan obsolete. Uh, but the Climate Emergency Declaration was not an action plan. And this Climate Emergency Work Plan is that Climate Action Plan. It outlines the actions that we need to take, but it also brings into sharp focus Council's specific role. And that is not to say that Council are, can do this alone, because it cannot. If you look at the 43 priorities, you can see that they involve and impact business and industry, community members, the nonprofit sector, academia, and other levels of government, including the county and the state. We will need everyone. In almost every case, these conversations have already begun and will continue over the lifespan of this work plan. Next slide, please. So while we cannot really overstate or minimize the severity of the worst case scenario if we don't act, I want to make it clear that there is good news, that we can do this, that we can reach our goals while simultaneously preparing our most vulnerable communities and making infrastructure investments in resilience. And I also want to mention that the decarbonization actions don't only reduce carbon, but they bring numerous co-benefits to our communities in the form of new business and workforce opportunities, cleaner air, uh, more accessible and plentiful transportation options, less congestion on our streets, and healthier, safer, and more comfortable homes and buildings. To the next slide, please. So, there's been a lot of talk about the analytics and the numbers under, underpaying the climate emergency work plan. Um, I did want to show that there is an analytical foundation to our decarbonization priorities in particular. What you're seeing here is output and analysis based on a model called our decarbonization pathways analysis. We did hire a consultant in 2020 to help us build this. We just call it pathways for short. But the purpose of the tool is to help policymakers and the public visualize the scale and combinations of specific climate strategies, and sometimes we call these wedges, needed to get to net zero. The wedges are, as Donnie mentioned, pretty well known and well established in the literature. Electricity, buildings, transportation, industry, and 
other, which is landfill emissions and fugitive emissions and things like that. So Pathways allows us to sort of toggle the scale of each of these strategies and combine them and show how different scenarios get us to different places. So it's dynamic, and it's hard to show a dynamic tool in a static document, but that's what we're trying to do. For the Climate Emergency Work Plan, we just chose one scenario, just for illustration and discussion purposes. We feel it's defensible. It was the middle of the road scenario. It is aggressive, but it's not the most aggressive, and it's also not the least. So it is um, a way to have the discussion. And BPS staff are happy to provide a look under the hood to anyone who wants to dive deeper into the analysis and the assumptions. But it is, a, it is very clear that it tells us a few things. And one of those is that there is no single strategy or reduction wedge that gets us to net zero. What gets us there is stacking each one of the strategies for an interactive and cumulative effect among them. It also tells us which carbon reduction strategies have the greatest impact in terms of, their, of reducing cumulative emissions. And you'll, as I mentioned them, you'll start to see that those map to what's listed in the priorities in the work plan on pages 5 through 10. But simply put, 100% renewable electricity is supply. This delivers huge carbon reductions. It has, um, it's a precursor and a foundation for many actions that come after it. The Portland Preferred Transportation Policy Scenario, you will hear about this from PBOT. Very, very important transportation emissions are a huge part and an increasing part of our emissions pie. Replacing gasoline and, and, and internal combustion engines with electric vehicles, over time, huge impact. Similarly, replacing diesel fuel with renewable biofuels and then industrial innovation. All of those strategies deliver somewhere between 6 and 12% of our overall reductions. And all the other little ones are like one, two, three, four percent that underscores the need to stack them all. Next slide, please. As we mentioned several times, the priority actions are divided among decarbonization and resilience. You can see that BPS and PBOT have purview over most of the decarbonization actions. And again, this doesn't mean that BPS and PBOT can do this alone. We are naming ourselves so as accountable and leads in all of the spaces where we're having these conversations with all of the industry stakeholders, all of the community stakeholders. On the resilience side, you can see that many more bureaus have a role in accomplishing the climate resilience outcomes for our community. And where the decarbonization actions largely contain policy directives and objectives, resilience actions are based in real-time solutions to address the impacts that are already here. And those are organized by risks, such as wildfire, flooding, heat, and smoke, as well as investments in the solutions, such as increased tree canopy, resource, natural resource protection, resilience hubs, and more. And we have Bureau leadership invited today, and you will hear more about those priorities as we go through the presentation. For now, I'm going to hand it back to Donnie to um, introduce our Bureau invited guests. Next slide, please. All right, thank you, Andrea. So as alluded to several times now, this is not a BPS work plan. This is a, a citywide work plan. And again, I can't thank enough my, my colleagues and the bureau directors, uh, their staff for their contributions, and not just that, but their commitment and sincere commitment to, to climate action. So um, those of you have the, the report in front of you, and for, for those at, um, uh, at home viewing, um, that's on our website. We're going to invite uh, bureau directors to come to just kind of share the highlights and where they're at from their bureau's perspective on the climate um, uh, agenda. So with that, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Director Chris Warner from Bureau of Transportation. I think he might be, um, he might be online. Yeah, I'm online. Yep, there we, and the next slide, please. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Director Oliveira, uh, Mayor Wheeler, members of council. For the record, Chris Warner, Director of PBOT. And I'm here to share some more detail about our approach to reducing emissions from the transportation sector while helping build community resilience in the face of more climate extremes, which are already impacting our community. Next slide, please. PBOT is committed to advancing equity and climate, climate justice. These two questions are embedded in our strategic plan and are at the core of all of our work. We always ask ourselves, will it advance equity and address uh, structural racism? and will it reduce carbon emissions? Importantly, how do we understand the intersectionality between these two questions in our response is something that we work through every day. Next slide. 
Uh, to set the context, unlike other sectors, Portland's transportation carbon emissions are heading in the wrong direction. The latest emission measurements from 2019 are up 3% since 1990, while city councils adopted a goal of 50% reduction by 2030. And while the 2020 data reflecting COVID may show temporary gains from decreased demand, just like after the Great Recession, we're not currently positioned to maintain those reductions as the economy recovers. In addition, transportation outcomes for Black, Indigenous, and peoples of color uh, continue to be inequitable. In short, we are not on target to meet our goals. While the city has adopted a net zero by 2050 goal, the climate science tells us that we must rapidly reduce emissions in the near term to avoid the catastrophic climate impacts and make it easier to achieve resilience through adaptation to changes already occurring uh, within, the within the climate. Uh, next slide, please. This triangle shows PBOT's strategy for reducing transportation emissions by 2030. It has three parts. The first is to rapidly reduce the miles that are driven and shift to more trips that are walking, biking, and transit. The second is for most motor vehicle trips that remain, we must rapidly transition to cleaner fuels and electric or other no or low carbon vehicles. And finally, we must continue to plan and build connected, complete communities and a transportation system that supports climate friendly trips to make it easier for people and businesses to meet their needs without having to drive. With more people able to meet their needs without driving, we can reduce the risk of the climate crisis while also supporting eco uh, local economic prosperity, a healthier community, uh, a healthier environment, and improve traffic and personal safety on our streets. At the same time, our community and our transportation system are already facing real impacts and increasing costs from climate change, from extreme heat to landslides. We must also plan for that. We must also invest and manage our assets and operations to support community resilience and prepare for, for more extreme weather now and into the future. Next slide. Having described our overall strategy, I wanted to take a couple of moments to highlight some of our recent accomplishments. For instance, last month, ownership of 82nd Avenue transferred from the state to the Portland Bureau of Transportation. It's a critical north-south connection in one of Portland's high crash corridors. This transfer and the state funding that came with it will allow us to make significant investments and operational changes to improve safety and to make it easier to walk, bike, and use transit in and around this corridor. While we have much work to do, we will need to identify additional funding to truly transform this corridor. We are thrilled to have to have reached this important milestone. Uh, later this month, PBOT is proud to be opening the, the Congressman Earl Blumenauer Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge. The Blumenauer Bridge will serve as a vital connection for pedestrians and people walking and biking between two of Portland's fastest growing neighborhoods, uh, Lloyd and Central East Side. In the future, it will also serve as an important link in the Green Loop. And the bridge is also, will also be seismically resilient and serve as a backup route for emergency vehicles over I-84 in, in the event of an earthquake. And this is our second uh, recent pedestrian bridge. Uh, the Flanders Crossing, which opened last summer, provides another critical low stress connection for active transportation users and also a, a seismic lifeline uh, in Northwest Portland. In January, we expanded our bike town service area growing by more than 25% and bringing the climate friendly bike share uh, system further east and north in Portland. So we're pretty excited about that. We've also continued to make investments in the Rose Lane transit projects to give buses and streetcars priority on the road, helping more Portlanders get where they need to go more reliably and quickly. And finally, the uh, parking climate and equitable mobility transaction fee that council approved this spring sends a small price signal about the cost of driving and will support investments that advance our climate and equity goals. We're especially proud to be investing in the expansion of the affordable housing transportation wallet and helping make transportation more affordable. It's also an exciting step towards uh, using the POEM Community Task Force principles to design pricing and investments to be climate friendly and equitable. And this program has been lauded nationally as smart climate policy. Next slide. While we are proud to have been able to accomplish this, uh, what we've done, we're especially proud that we have done it in the last couple of years when PBOT has taken a 10% cut toward discretionary revenues. Uh, even though we, we do have accomplishments, we have a, a, a lot more work to do. 
The priority areas that we highlighted on this slide should be familiar. We know that we, what we must do to reduce carbon emissions, and we have highlighted those strategies before. Yet there's an urgency to accelerate and expand our work in each of these areas. And I wanna highlight a few of PBOT specific items in the work plan before you today. We will continue making investments to provide safe and accessible low carbon transportation facilities. We have many millions of dollars of investments uh, in our project pipeline, yet we have hundreds of millions of dollars of additional unfunded investments identified in the transportation system plan. And we know that each of these yet unfunded investments are critical in order to provide a fully accessible and safe system for easy multimodal travel citywide. Our work plan also identifies the need to continue to pinpoint new and more financially sustainable revenue sources that are both decoupled from fossil fuel dependence and send the right price signals about the true cost of driving. We know that our impact will be greater if we can act as a region and a state. So we're continuing to work with our regional partners to make sure they are pulling in the same direction, both in terms of how revenues are generated, as well as the policies and projects they are advancing to reduce vehicle miles traveled and to electrify the remaining miles. And in terms of electrification, we are focused on updates to our codes and to our rules to enable our utility and other private sector partners to more easily provide charging infrastructure. We're also supporting state efforts to rapidly uh, decarbonize fuels and to prioritize an equitable investment strategy for new federal electrification funds. And it's no longer just to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change is here and we must also become more resilient. We have, we have to build resiliency more strongly into our system and into our projects so that we can respond to more and more frequent threats to our assets and operations from flooding, landslides, heat, smoke, wildfire, snow and ice, uh, you name it. You will see that work, you will see that the work plan includes specific items that, that like landslide prevention on West Burnside, as well as broader and more comprehensive continuity of operation planning work that will enable us to respond to these increasingly frequent extreme weather events. It will require significant resources to keep Portland safe and moving as we continue to uh, take on climate change. So um, that is my presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague from Parks, uh, uh, Director Adina Long. Thank you, Chris. Can we get to get for the slide deck a little bit? It's up. There we go. Nope. Next nope. slide. Two, nope. more. Two more. Two more. Oh, <laughs> there, we there we are. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, again, my name is Adina Long. I'm the Director of Portland Parks and Recreation. Um, uh, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for inviting us here today. Uh, there are many actions the city and Portland Parks can take within our green spaces and community gathering places around climate action. Many resiliency priorities are already part of our core mission, including planting trees and caring for our urban forests, caring for and managing wildfire risk in our natural areas, and providing opportunities for shade and access to water, both naturally and through interactive fountains, splash pads, and pools. A key climate resilience goal for Portland Parks and Recreation is to invest in trees. Like cities and nations across the world, increasing tree canopy significantly helps us combat climate change. Trees clean the air, improve the soil, reduce the heat island effect, support wildlife, and improve community health and well-being. Urban forestry's focus is on strengthening protection of existing trees, making them a priority in street design and other development, and setting new goals to expand the urban forest. As a community, we must protect and preserve our tree canopy because in fact, the best trees for the planet are the ones already in the ground. Work is also underway with partners to better respond to wildfires through prevention and protection of our green infrastructure. Portland Parks and Recreation plans to continue identifying funding for ecological restoration efforts that control invasive plant species in our natural areas and for vegetation management projects that specifically target ladder fuels. We'll also continue to work with our partners at Portland Fire and Rescue, Multnomah County Emergency Management, and the Oregon Department of Forestry 
in our efforts to reduce wildfire risk and plan ahead to reduce impacts from wildfire events. Portland Parks and Recreation also has opportunities to build climate resilience for places where our community already gathers, our community centers, and outdoor spaces. Land upgrades to community centers will strengthen our resilience and provide refuge from heat, cold, and wildfire smoke. EPNR is participating in a number of efforts led by other bureaus as well, and we're proud to be partners in this collaborative work. I want to pass it to Dawn, but I'm not quite certain if she's next yet, if you were jumping around a little bit. Yep. All right. Next slide, please. Thank you, Director Long. Appreciate that. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. It's a delight to be here this afternoon and to be here with um, my infrastructure uh, bureau directors and uh, contributing to this important work. Uh, my name is Don Uchiyama. I'm the interim director at the Bureau of Environmental Services. I don't have a slide today, uh, but I do want to acknowledge that this topic is near and dear to the hearts of uh, BES. And it's uh, something that we've uh, contributed to uh, for a long time. And we're very excited today to report on our accomplishments from this past year and then looking ahead at what we anticipate. So uh, for this past year, um, some things that we've been working on that we'd like to highlight is our, our mitigation action plan. We've uh, addressed or we're com committed to addressing local flooding, river flooding, extreme heat, drought, wildfire, and landslides and extreme uh, weather conditions in our, our, with our own assets. Uh, we're continuing our work on the Johnson Creek uh, floodplain and some of the wetlands in the area. We continue to acquire property and restore uh, restore wetlands and floodplains on, on, on Johnson Creek. Uh, we're committed to uh, continuing to plant trees and, and are partnering again with our infrastructure bureaus uh, around the city, not, not in any particular, but in areas of, of greatest need. Our Green Streets program continues uh, to, uh, to build additional stormwater facilities and we're building those citywide. Uh, we are excited to launch our low carbon uh, concrete uh, uh, specifications and uh, contribute to that new technology in the city. And uh, we are also uh, very proud of our resource recovery and renewable uh, natural gas program that we have at the wastewater treatment plant. So those are just a few of the highlights from our past year. Uh, looking forward, what we're very excited uh, to, uh, to uh, work on and know that we'll be making some great advancements with our floodplain, floodplain mapping and, and updates to our floodplains. Uh, we're also uh, busy to incorporate uh, our, uh, some of our resiliency work uh, in our CIP planning and design, and we're coordinating with our, with our infrastructure partners uh, in that. Uh, we are also uh, looking to um, uh, create our, our citywide green infrastructure approach and, and also collaborating with other bureaus. And uh, then uh, our mitigation banking, we're very excited to uh, launch uh, potentially a new program uh, that will allow us to uh, make um, make improvements on the Willamette River. So we've, we've uh, accomplished a lot this past year. We have a number of exciting initiatives that are coming up next year. And uh, I personally would like to uh, uh, make a pitch and, and uh, really emphasize the importance of leadership development in this space. Uh, we have a lot of emerging leaders and a lot of energy and excitement and enthusiasm. And I'd like to see the city invest in that as well as our organizational development and continuing the, the um, collaboration and coordination that has existed with the bureaus. It's very important uh, for us to continue to do that. So with that, I'll uh, conclude my remarks and I'm not sure who is next, but uh, we are um, very honored to be a part of this work. Thanks, Don. And I'm gonna uh, invite our Chief Resiliency Officer, Jana Papa F. Thimiu to share her comments. Next slide, please. Hi, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? I'm outside, if you can't tell. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Jana Popeff Thimiu, and I work at the Bureau of Emergency Management, where I'm the Chief Resilience Officer. Um, I wish so much that I could tell you about the critical milestones that PM had achieved in the last year in advancing climate resilience for Portland. Um, but unfortunately, in the last few years, our climate milestones have really been of a totally different sort. Um, we had our first time responding to an air quality emergency within the city of Portland. We had our first time managing a shelter for wildfire evacuees here in the city. We had our first experience opening and staffing an emergency cooling center. And we organized a memorial for people who passed away in last summer's heat dome. 
This is work at the front lines of the climate emergency and it saved lives and it supported people who are already facing severe impacts from climate disruption. But it also emphasized how critical mitigation actions are because these last minute interventions are resource intensive for the city, they're exhausting for the community and the reach is necessarily always limited. We can help a lot more people by preventing disasters than by responding to them. Every bureau has a role to play in getting ahead of disaster and building a climate resilient Portland and the actions outlined in this work plan show a path forward. For PBEM, we're a coordination bureau. Over the last 18 months, we brought together all the public safety and infrastructure bureaus to update the city's hazard mitigation action plan. By convening the citywide group to co-develop projects and then seek funding outside of the city to support projects, we've helped advance MIDI strategies, including floodplain restoration, tree planting, and construction of community-based resilience hubs. PBM has coordinated applications for FEMA funding for all these projects in the last year. In the last year, PBM also convened a coalition of organizations active in disaster and worked with over 90 community-based organizations that have become partners in emergency response and climate resilience. And even today, today, we're reaching out to those same partners with heat safety information in multiple languages and requesting them to help volunteer at misting stations and parks and open community-based cooling spaces in anticipation of extreme heat again next week. We're also right now reviewing grant applications from community-based organizations, and we'll be awarding $300,000 in small and medium-sized grants to community-based organizations for climate resilience projects that advance the same approaches in this plan in ways that are culturally specific and hyper-local. I really appreciate the leadership of Donnie, of Andrea, and many colleagues at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability and around the city in advancing climate change mitigation and adaptation. And I look forward to returning to Council later this year for the adoption of our Natural Hazard Mitigation Action Plan and report on the work of community partners who receive our grant awards for climate resilience. And I also hope to be back with implementation of more projects as we move forward. Thanks. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, okay. So we're gonna acknowledge that there was a, a slide that was supposed to be there for BPS to talk about our highlights. We're just gonna share those details and add a slide later. I wanna just take, take a moment to acknowledge and thank uh, my colleagues for joining us, uh, especially wanna uh, acknowledge uh, Director Long, uh, Director Uchiyama, and our Chief Resiliency Officer, Papa Efetimiu, for joining at a relatively late request. Um, on, uh, apologies for that, but thank you so much. As you can clearly see, uh, their passion about climate, so it was easy for them to convey their, their bureau successes because it's top of mind. Uh, before I hand it over uh, to Andrew to walk through BPS's successes, it's been shared in a couple of spaces. I want to just really acknowledge that, uh, as Commissioner Rubio mentioned, we are going to be uh, launching a sustainability commission, which will act as our city's uh, sort of oversight body led by community, our partners, uh, to think about how we address climate on a citywide level. Uh, Director Uchiyama mentioned uh, the leadership capacity building opportunities in climate action. I totally support that and agree that we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of passionate city staff that we hope to engage as we develop a citywide climate action uh, implementation plan like the one we're sharing with you today. And lastly, and, and if, if not more importantly, uh, our work with the county uh, continues to be uh, strategic and essential to our, our successes. And, I'm, and we're really excited to continue our work with the county on, on meeting our climate goals. Uh, so with that, um, Andrea, please uh, share our highlights. Yes, and apologize for losing that slide. I don't know. Uh, I had some pictures, so I'll try to paint a picture with my words. Uh, we were going to talk about uh, the highlight reel from last year, what we've done, and then a look forward. And I was going to do that um, with six different items. Um, renewable fuels, climate and health standards for existing buildings, 100% clean electricity, EV-ready housing, industrial emissions, and the internal cost of carbon. And I'll just go through those each in turn. So since our progress report last year, we were here just about a year ago giving a one-year progress report on the climate emergency declaration, we have continued to build the foundation for the next generation of climate policies. These are based on the best available science, evidence-based practices from around the globe, and grounded in the wisdom and experience of our communities, as we've mentioned. So on the renewable fuel standard, that is item T9 in the, in the work plan, coming to council later this fall, um, this code amendment proposal, which would phase out 
petroleum diesel sold in the city of Portland over the next several years will be out for public comment late next month. Over the past year, BPS staff re refined the proposed code amendments based on stakeholder research, interviews, evaluation of fuel forecasting data, and ongoing conversations with industry experts. And we also began to explore the opportunities for inclusive economic development for our BIPOC communities and entrepreneurs and workers presented by biofuels in the alternative fuels market. The RFS is a highly innovative and high impact climate policy and it will put Portland back on the national and international stage as a climate leader when we bring it forth. Number two, climate and health standards. This is item B1 in the work plan. After more than two years of co-creation with community, anchored by the incredible leadership of the Coalition of Communities of Color and Verde, BPS staff launched stakeholder engagement for this policy concept this past spring. We spent eight weeks introducing this concept of climate and health standards for existing buildings to two working groups that included associations like BOMA, PBA, Multifamily Northwest, impacted property owners like Unico and American Assets Trust, renter associations like the Community Alliance of Tenants, and community-based organizations like Urban League, NAACP, Latino Network, Leaders Become Legends, and Apano, among others. We stipended community organizations to be at the table with us over those eight weeks. And we're continuing this process over the summer. This is a deep and complex policy. The conversations have been ongoing. They will continue over the next few years. Um, over the summer, we will have meetings focused on resolving specific concerns that came out of the first phase of stakeholder engagement. And then we'll also delve deeper into the needs of certain priority populations like Portland's Native American communities. Three, 100% clean electricity. This is action E1 in the plan. BPS, in partnership with the Multnomah County Office of Sustainability, our electric utilities, PGE and Pacific Power, the Public Utilities Commission, and community-based organizations have been working to figure out how to implement Oregon's landmark clean electricity law passed two years ago, or a year ago, I'm sorry. We are grateful for the funding that council allocated in this past budget for this current year to staff this critical work. So our next steps involve hiring an analyst, designing a community engagement process, engaging at the utility commission, assessing the cost and the risks of this program to the city and our ratepayers, and eventually crafting a participation agreement that city council will vet in a public process over the next couple years. From a carbon impact perspective, this is a biggie. This is probably the biggest one. This action alone could achieve a 58% reduction in our emissions from buildings and energy supply by 2030. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Would you prefer I hold my questions until you are done? I am almost done, so I'll just be, if that's okay. I will okay. be happy to okay. hold it until you're done. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the fourth action is EV ready codes, item T6. Um, the first phase of this is coming next winter and subsequent phases of this work will come in each of the fiscal years covered by the work plan. This is a zoning code update that will require 50% of parking spaces in newly built multi-dwelling and mixed-use construction to include EV-ready infrastructure. And this has been a close collaboration between the climate and land use sides of BPS with BDS and the State Building Codes Division. And as I mentioned on the pathway slide, electric vehicles are a huge carbon reduction strategy. The clean industry analysis, item I-1, underway right now. This past year, thanks to funding from council in the fall bump of 2021, we hired a project coordinator to lead a discovery process for creating a clean industry hub in Portland. And the aim of this hub is to help industry decarbonize, reduce waste and air pollution, while create an inclusive economic opportunity for black, indigenous, and people of color communities. This week, actually, BPS and Prosper have been deep in the selection process for the consultant to lead this analysis, and we hope to get to a decision very soon. Finally, the internal cost of carbon, item C1 in the plan. Council passed this important internal policy in 2020, but we did not have the resources to implement it to move it forward. And again, we're very grateful to council, for council's leadership in funding a position at BPS to finally implement what is considered a best practice among the global cities leading on climate. The truth is, as Donnie said, none of the easy stuff remains. We have been at this a long time and we have made progress, but the policies we need next are deep and transformational. They inherently challenge the status quo 
and they attempt to reorder systems that have been reliant on fossil fuels for a very, very long time. There are costs to this transition, and we understand that they are politically complicated. But the cost of inaction is far greater. And doing nothing only saddles our youth and future generations with existential burdens not of their making. It's now or never for the climate. Please choose now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does that complete the presentation? It does, Mayor. Excellent. Good work. Commissioner Hardesty, you're up first. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. This was some absolutely fabulous information. And I want, I, I'm, I'm going to go right to a weed because that's just what I do when I read. And so as I look at uh, page five of your presentation, E1 talks about the electric supply and um, prioritizing implementing this new state 100% clean electricity law. Now, as someone who lives in East Portland, who uh, lacks like sidewalks and street lights and many of the uh, amenities that other parts of the city enjoy, when I read that, I think I won't live long enough to see my community electrified. Um, and one, A, and B, the state has never in my time at, on city council actually produced a bill that worked as intended. So I guess my question is, <clears throat> why is that a priority as compared to all the other things we could be doing around climate mitigation? And how do we make sure that we're not institutionalizing more inequities as we try to address climate change? So either of you or both yeah, of you, I go first. Okay. Um, so the, first of all, um, the clean ele electricity is the biggest uh, source of our emissions in Portland. So without a clean grid, we can't really do electric vehicles, we can't do heat pumps, we can't do all of the things that come later because those will be using dirty power. So we want to make sure that as we're transitioning off fossil fuels that the replacement for that is clean and renewable. And so what this is suggesting is that, I mean, we all turn on our lights, you know, and we get power, right? So what, we're, what this action would do is that nothing for you changes except that when you turn on your light, the source of that electricity instead of being from coal or other fossil fuels is 100% clean. So it becomes a default option is what we're trying to go for. And that was the provision in the electricity law, House Bill 2021, that did pass. And the electric utilities are moving in, in order to achieve those goals. So what that law did was set a 100% emissions-free goal for the state by 2040. So that is state law. And they, are, they have hit all of those goals. I mean, generally, as we've advanced the renewable portfolio standard and clean electricity standards, the utilities have done that. Um, so they can figure it out. And when you say the utility, are you talking about the private utility companies that have been selling us clean energy for a long time that wasn't clean? Those? They are. I, there is some mystery to some of the products that they sell, but we know, according to the um, to their report, for the reporting to the Public Utility Commission, that they are tracking with the renewable portfolio standard established by the state. So, what is our role in that? So. Our role in that is so they that is their job is to do the poles and wires and provide the electricity. What the provisions in House Bill 2021 did was actually give local governments a role in what is in that electricity supply, a role that we've actually never had before. So the participation agreement would be to discuss with them what exactly are the sources, what are we buying. It actually adds a lot of transparency and agency over that electricity system that, that actually hasn't happened before. And so prior to that law getting passed, BPS staff worked kind of in the, in the trenches with a coalition of community-based organizations to pass the law, get that provision, and now we're trying to execute against it. But it's complicated. Um, there's ways to do it that are more community benefiting, and that's our role, is to kind of sit between and with community and the electric utilities to advocate for our values in that electricity supply. So I completely understand you. I'm not one to just blindly trust utilities either. But uh, without their infrastructure and their resources and their support, we, we can't we can't have clean vehicles. We can't have clean homes. We need that fuel supply, that electricity supply, to be clean first and foremost. So that's why it's at the top of the list. It's sort of a foundational. And I'm, I, how will we know 
if we are equitably de providing this service, especially for the people with the least access to options? Right. So I think that's the public process that we would be going through with City Council. So none of this will be behind closed doors that we're just going to craft an agreement. This will all be public facing. There'll be a process leading up to it, discussions, and then that participation agreement that we're talking about outlines what we're buying. And I think staff's role in those next two years is to evaluate and vet what the utilities are saying. And the reason that position that you all funded is so important is because we typically have a much lighter bench than the utilities. They usually bring all the lobbyists, all the lawyers, all the analysts, and we have one little me. <laughs> and now we're going to have like the ability to actually hire an expert who can come sit at that table and correct that asymmetry. And, and, and Commissioner, just to add to that, uh, as a part of the policy directive, uh, environmental justice concerns were, were or day lit as part of the transition. So for example, like in East Portland, uh, if that was gonna be a burden on communities, there'd be rate relief as a part of, of that transition. So that was actually in the policy directive uh, that was passed. Yeah, and acknowledging that our, our uh, community coalitions that led that uh, like certainly were influential in, in making that happen. I'm really happy to hear that. And is there, like, is it tied to uh, cost of living or median family income or minimum wage? What is it tied to? It, it would be uh, income. Income. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, my last question before I turn it over to my colleagues. B1 on page 6 talks about uh, eliminating carbon from existing buildings in the private market. This is normally where we get out, uh, we get in trouble. Uh, when we're out trying to dictate policy and activities in the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I noticed about B1 is that there's a lot of people missing and there's a lot of money missing. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what is your vision of what the city's role will be in eliminating carbon from private market buildings? So great question, Commissioner. So B1, I think, is a great example of where Andrea and her team have been trying to take a really broad approach to ensure that many voices are heard and what it would look like to implement a building performance standard. So if we're going to set a sort of a market standard of what a building, how a building should perform in terms of air quality, energy performance, et cetera, we're not just going to plant that flag and walk away. It says, let's look with, let's look with our building partners, our communities that are, are running uh, rental housing, affordable housing, they're, they're all impacted, right? So how do we create a robust policy that's informed by the people that will implement it? All right, so that's first and foremost. When the question comes to how we're actually gonna pay for it, I'll be perfectly frank, that's where we need more, more research, more understanding of the actual impacts, how we're leveraging capital uh, improvement plans that buildings might have already, ensuring that the systems that we're investing aren't, aren't overburdening our, our uh, business community, frankly, our housing community. Uh, but the truth is, like building stock has to be upgraded, not just for performance, but also for, for health standards, the ability to withstand uh, heat domes and heat crises. And, and actually, you know, we haven't experienced a really cold winter like we may be experiencing due to climate. Are our homes prepared for that? So it's not just a matter of building performance for, for the climate to reduce our, our um, greenhouse gas emissions, but frankly, how to be resilient in the face of the extreme weather. And I'm not gonna stop to allow Andrew to give more details on what the policy might look like. <laughs> Yep. Unless and, you have and, further questions, I think we'll yeah, leave. And, yeah. and just, just a heads up, folks. We're, we're an hour into this. Okay. We have about 50 minutes of public testimony, and I want to make sure we Got get it. to the public. Thank you. Um, not to stop the questions, no. but let, let's not give dissertations. Let's be short and to the point and answer the questions to the best of their ability. And if, if we can't answer the question, just say we can't answer the question today, but we'll get back to you. Commissioner Maps. Um, I have some policy questions, but um, I know we have public testimony, so I'll defer my questions till later on. Very good. Commissioner Hardesty? Okay. Great. Uh, so I neglected to have legal counsel read the rules of order and decorum. Uh, if anybody wants to use the restroom, this is always a good time. Please take it away. <laughs> Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding a hybrid public meeting with limited in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the council agenda at the council clerk's website at www.portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. 
in-person testimony may occur from one of the several locations, including City Council Chambers and the Lovejoy Room in City Hall and the Portland Building. Written testimony may be submitted to cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at this time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such, such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected from the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Very well done. Everybody, there will be a quiz later, so I hope you took good notes. Keelan, uh, first, folks, up please, uh, three minutes each, and please state your name for the record. Even if we know you, uh, you need to state your name for the record. Thank you. Uh, first up, we have John Wazatinsky. Hey, John. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler. Good afternoon, members of the council. My name is uh, John Wazatinsky. I'm the Multnomah County Sustainability Director, and I'm here today to offer, on behalf of the county, my strong support for this resolution and plan. Um, for over 20 years, Multnomah County and the City of Portland have worked side by side to address cl uh, climate change. Uh, when we began our efforts, this was really born out of a frustration at the lack of urgency at the federal level to confront this problem. So we decided to do something about it locally. Um, but back then, of course, the impacts of climate change seemed far off. Today, sadly, federal action continues to be lacking, but the climate uh, change impacts are no longer an abstraction. I think Jana did a good job of hitting the highlight reel um, that has been a sort of a living nightmare for us uh, over the past couple of years. Um, taking action to reduce our emissions um, and strengthen our resiliency are critical. And on action after action in this plan, Multnomah County and the city are working side by side. But the area of collaboration that I'm most excited about um, between, our, between our two jurisdictions um, is the effort that uh, called the, uh, is, which is we're calling the Climate Justice Plan. That effort's just getting going right now. Um, and it will center frontline communities as co-creators with government of um, a vision for more just and sustainable community. This ongoing collaboration is not only a continuation of the collaboration um, that we've had over the past decades, but also an evolution. And I think Donnie alluded to that. We have known uh, that the solutions to the climate crisis are not only technocratic, but real, real solutions also require us to confront the work uh, to resolve um, sources of injustice in our communities. That's what we plan to tackle in the climate justice plan. Um, but not, uh, so I'm so grateful uh, to my colleagues uh, at BPS uh, to have them as partners in this, in this journey. Um, and I'm excited that we continue to collaborate, um, that you continue to collaborate with your colleagues at the, at the, on the Multnomah County Council. And um, I think this is a great and important first step that you're taking today to adopt this plan. And I urge your yes vote. Thank, Thank you. you, appreciate your being here. Next up, we have Oriana Magnera. Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, for the record, my name is Oriana Magnera, and I'm the Energy, Climate, and Transportation Manager at Verde and a registered lobbyist. I'm here in support of item 656, the Climate Emergency Declaration Work Plan. Verde's mission is to build environmental wealth for communities to through organizing, advocacy, and social enterprise. Environmental wealth is not only clean air and affordable renewable energy, but encompassed in each of the elements of the Climate Emergency Declaration Work Plan. Verde works closely with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability in a variety of ways, one of which includes many uh, other community partners through Build Shift to develop climate and health standards for existing buildings, a key element of the work plan that we hope will continue to move forward with collaboration across a diverse group of stakeholders and led by Indigenous, Black, Brown, 
Latinx, Latin A, and Asian Pacific Islander communities. This process has taken consistent and thoughtful work over many years, including deep engagement during the height of the pandemic. This work is also not a destination, but a generative space to develop and deepen relationships between city government and stakeholders. The Climate Emergency Declaration should be complementary in this regard. It's not enough to make a declaration or work plan, but consistent investment and commitment are needed to keep a number of crucial projects moving forward. As climate change worsens, whereas is are not enough, clear actions that forward resilience, reduce emissions, and provide tangible benefits to the communities most impacted by heat islands, poor air quality, and high energy bills must be moved forward every year. The funding council allocated for climate in the fiscal year 22-23 budget is a good start and is heartening to see new staff capacity in our city sustainability programs. We are also supportive of the element of the resolution before you that establishes a pathway to a climate justice plan. Some may wonder why this is important and why the city does not just continue to incorporate equity into the climate action plan itself. Taking that approach may provide broad benefit, but it will not create the necessary support for environmental justice communities. Instead, Verde does its work through the principle of targeted universalism, which says that prioritizing those who are most impacted will lead to broad benefit in a way that, to achieve dual goals of emission reductions and equity. Planting trees in neighborhoods like Cully lowers city temperatures as a whole, but maximizes relief for the people who are most vulnerable on the hottest days. There are many elements of targeted universalism in the work plan before you, and it's a good snapshot of this moment in time of the work that is needed to move forward climate action and climate justice. And every single one of these steps is needed and needed with expediency. These are vetted actions that are the re result of substantial outreach and collaboration. Expert staff has sequenced actions strategically, invested resources accordingly, and followed community-led work that will chart a new path toward more equitable outcomes. Please help this work plan to begin in earnest and support the actions along the way. I hope we can look back in a year and the years after that and feel proud of the progress we have made. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next up, we have Mary Pavato. Good afternoon, my name is Mary Pivato. I'm the Executive Director of Neighbors for Clean Air, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and all the council members, but especially thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for the tremendous amount of work that your staff um, have brought to um, the city and the opportunity that this represents. Um, we all know that the burning of fossil fuels is causing a rise in world temperatures. One only needs to look this week at historic heat waves from Europe to the Great Plains and to recall Portland's own experiences with the heat dome and wildfires of the last few years. As temperatures rise, scientists predict increased heat-related deaths, such as the tragic 69 people who lost their lives here in Multnomah County. Yet today, as recent research confirms, we're already losing 10 million people a year. Yes, from bad air and the burning of fossil fuels. That's 100 million people a decade. According to the University of Chicago's Air Quality Life Index, particulate air pollution is the single largest threat to human health globally. The majority, 60% of this, comes from the burning of fossil fuels. The loss of life from air pollution outstrips all communicable diseases, including COVID. It even surpasses wars. By burning fossil fuels and creating bad air, we are doing more to destroy humanity than any other single threat. It's beyond the loss of life and something we can see every day in our communities. Air pollution is to blame for a host of issues and disparities that you as a council deal with every day, from physical health, mental health, even violence and crime. Breathing bad air is associated with everything from premature births to loss of mental function to diminished academic performance to higher rates of developmental delays, Alzheimer's disease, and more. Every single cell in the human body is damaged by bad air. As David Wallace Wells details in an article in the London Review just recently, on bad air days, umpires make bad calls, surgeons don't perform as well, and crime rates skyrocket. If we reduce air pollution associated with the burning of fossil fuels, if you all make the decision to invest in this important work and take the steps this work plan asks for, it will be our health and our communities that will benefit most. It has the potential to improve people's lives and well-being while also taking on one of the greatest ex existential crises of our time. Thank you very much. Here. Next up, we have Jeff Hall. 
Next up, we have Nikita Daryanani. Welcome. Good, af good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Nikita Daryanani, and I'm the Climate and Energy Policy Manager at the Coalition of Communities of Color, or CCC. I'm here today to give public comment in support of the Climate Emergency Work Plan and the urgency of taking climate action by supporting and fully funding the critical steps laid out in the plan. CCC works and has worked very closely with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability on several climate justice initiatives, such as Climate Justice by Design and Build Shift, which both represent a shift from the traditional ways in which policies are developed and planning is conducted. And through these projects, we're working with community members and other stakeholders to co-create policy that improves health and well-being of residents, such as the HEART standards, and working with Multnomah County to develop a community-driven climate justice plan. By now, we all know that the climate crisis is not on the horizon, it's here. And we know that low-income folks and Black, Indigenous, and people of color disproportionately bear the burden of this crisis. Low-income BIPOC communities are more likely to live in neighborhoods with less tree coverage and in older housing without proper insulation and ventilation. Our solutions must center these lived experiences and be holistic, incorporated meaningfully in everything we do moving forward. The Climate Emergency Work Plan acknowledges this need by prioritizing co-benefits and community resilience, and demonstrates how much more we need to do. The city has made and is making great strides to address climate equity and advance community-driven solutions to climate change, and it's critical that this work continue and expand. The Climate Emergency Work Plan presents an all-hands-on-deck approach to the city's climate action that's urgently necessary to meet the moment, and a pathway for how the city bureaus, community leaders, utilities, and other cross-sector stakeholders will work together to curb emissions and build resilience. Adopting this work plan is critical to ensuring this, that, the, that city efforts are strategic, that resources are being prioritized effectively, and that opportunities are created for more collaboration with community groups and organizations like ours. We also underscore the importance of fully resourcing the items in this work plan so that we're able to take swift and effective action. We look forward to continuing to partner with BPS, other bureaus, and a broad range of stakeholders to advance equitable community-led climate solutions and urge you to adopt this work plan and support and fund the strategies in it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have James Paulson. Thank you. Good to see you. <clears throat> Check one, two. Hello, my name is James Paulson, and I'm the board chair for Friends of Frog Ferry. And I'm here today to look, ask for your support in moving this project forward. As we look at this um, plan for uh, reducing emissions and making not only Portland, but uh, the world a better place, I have an opportunity where Portland can actually have a project which aligns perfectly with everything that I've heard outlined in this plan. In that with just the pilot program, we've done studies and we've found that during the pilot program, we could take almost 200,000 cars during that program off the road, which would have a savings of over 3,000 metric tons of CO2. I've heard a lot of different proposals and plans, but I haven't heard a lot about outcomes. That's what we're talking about. We've done the research. We're looking for outcomes. We want to get people out of their cars. We want to use one of our greatest resources, which is our river. Let's use our river to move people up and down to jobs. We've got great partnerships. We've centered our partnerships up in the St. John's Cathedral Park neighborhood because we know that neighborhood is underserved by transportation. We know that that neighborhood has historically been um, less privileged than other neighborhoods. And so we said, let's go and let's make this a community-driven program. And so we've gone to that neighborhood. We've also reached out to businesses and employers. One of our key partners is OHSU. We've talked to them. They've gone to their employees. And their employees overwhelmingly say a ferry system would be great. And so what we need is we need your help so that we can bring this public-private ferry system to fruition. 
We cannot do it alone. We cannot do it without your support. This very system is in direct alignment with everything that has been said today. We've dropped off packets to each of your different offices, so I'm not going to go into details about what's included in those, but that is where the information lies. And without your support, we will not have a ferry system. With your support, we can bring this ferry system to fruition. There are federal dollars that we can go after, that we should go after. We need to bring those dollars to this community. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Lynn Handlin. Hi, my name is Lynn Handlin, and I am with Extinction Rebellion Portland. Um, we're living in a climate emergency. It's time for Portland to act like it. Those are really nice words and very accurate. It's too bad that this climate work plan shows that the city council is not really acting like it. There's a lot of pretty pictures, some really good graphs, some very good language, and some good proposals. But the city budget allocates less than 0.06% on climate change, which is, you know, basically nothing. So that's not good. Um, in the section on transportation, there seems to be a lot of reliance on renewable fuels to reduce emissions. The problem with that is that renewable fuels can actually be worse on climate than fossil fuels in some, in many instances. And the feedstock, the stuff that biofuel is made with, can be very problematic. Feedstocks such as soy and palm oils can actually have a higher carbon production cost than fossil fuels. And then there's induced land use change. Cutting down forests to grow fuel or replacing food crops with fuel crops is really just a bad idea. We need to transition away from burning stuff to get around, whether it's fossil fuel or biofuels. The pricing options from the equitable mobility section of the plan is one of the true bright spots of this, of this whole plan. The Portland Clean Energy Fund is another bright spot voted in by the people in spite of the Portland Business Alliance and some here on the city council who um, have been trying to weaken it. Um, and then there's trees. The plan recognizes the importance of trees and that's good. Unfortunately, the city has not demonstrated that they can handle trees very well. Why did the city break up with Friends of Trees? That was a partnership that was working well to expand tree planting and maintenance and getting a lot of really good community involvement. It's been replaced with programs that get less trees planted with little or no community involvement. The various bureaus do not communicate well when it comes to trees. A prime example is the Peabot's Division Street Transportation Project in Outer Southeast. This area experiences summer temperatures up to 15 degrees hotter than neighborhoods east of the Willamette with significantly greater tree canopy, according to your documents, and it's true. Um, a few years ago, Peabot came to my little business association with a lot of diagrams and models showing a lot of big tree, a lot of trees planted in the median of Southeast Division Street east of I-205, where the money mostly isn't. Fast forward to, day, to today, and that project is nearly done with not a tree in sight. Apparently, Peabot forgot to discuss trees with the Water Bureau, so now there are no trees, just more hot pavement and concrete in this part of the city that needs it so badly, where the money isn't. Also, we need an immediate moratorium on cutting large trees on public and private property and not wait two years while developers continue to cut down trees and cut down every big tree left in the city. With the federal government's climate actions being essentially gutted by the Supreme Court and Joe Manchin, we're all counting on local governments everywhere to do the work. We're counting on you. You have a chance to be climate leaders, so for the sake of our children and future generations, please act like we're living in emergency and put some money behind it. Big chunks of money, not just teeny tiny crumbs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. Next up, we have Soren Garber. Welcome. Uh, good, ap good afternoon, Mayor, Re Mayor Wheeler and commission members. I want to applaud and cheer on Commissioner Rubio and BPS staff for developing this much needed blueprint for meeting our climate and decarbonization goals. It's both an effective and practical approach for um, making meaningful achievement. Uh, my name is Soren Garber. I'm a Southwest Portland resident. I'm also a friend of the Frog Ferry. And I'd like to offer a suggested additional work plan action related to both transportation and emergency planning. And that is the action to be that the city act as a sponsor for federal funds for the Frog Ferry that the council request would be to simply identify the city 
as the public authority for receipt of federal funds of which there's $3.6 billion for ferries alone in the uh, latest federal infrastructure bill. For grants that will provide up to 80, well, start at 80%, sometimes 90% of capital needs. It matters because the peninsula and the I-5 corridor, which would be served by um, the pilot study, generate the highest concentrations of carbon and, and particulate matter for transportation in the city. The Frog Ferry would divert travelers out of cars to the ferry, which would operate on renewable diesel in the pilot, and if successful, would um, go to a zero emission electric vehicle. And this would be available and ready to get started the fiscal year 2023 to 2024. I know in the past, um, the council has talked about um, the issues with the format of the invoices from to TriMet. Um, but one thing I want to make sure that everyone understands is that there was never any discussion or argument about the content of the work. All contract obligations were met, which demonstrated that very much so the Frog Ferry is both um, feasible navigation-wise and feasible financially. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we have Jan Zuckerman. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, can go ahead, Jan. Thank you. Um, my name is Jan Zuckerman, and I'm a mentor for the Portland Youth Climate Council. Members of the, of the Portland Climate Council are unavailable to speak today because of their work schedules and other commitments. They wrote the following testimony and asked me to share it with you today. While we appreciate the work that the BPS has done to spell out the need for immediate action to address the climate, we can't help feel, after reading the work plan, that the funding and people power needed to protect our future has not been or has ever truly been a priority in our city. The following examples demonstrate this. The transportation sector assumption states that in order to achieve net zero emissions, Portland implements all of the actions in Scott's preferred transportation policy scenario. This is vaguely described as Hey, Jan. Jan, I'm sorry, we, we can't hear you for some reason. Um, we're, we're hearing most of what you're saying, but it, it sounds like your microphone is going in and going out. Is, is there something blocking the microphone, possibly? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you sound good now. Go ahead and try, start start from the, the last paragraph back, and we'll give you a little bit extra time. Sorry about that. Um, the following example demonstrates this. Do you hear me now? Yeah, now it sounds good. Thanks. The transportation sector assumptions state that in order to achieve zero net emissions, or net zero emissions, Portland implements all of the actions in CBOT's preferred transportation policy scenario. This is vaguely described as a transportation system that decreases driving and promotes safe infrastructure. This is scary for us, given this scenario is preferred rather than one that's sure to be implemented or required. In addition, if we were unable to convince PBOT in its pedestrian plan to require furniture zones wide enough for large form trees, how can we trust them with our future? especially with such non-specific language and so many to be determined. How can we reduce traffic and lower emissions where city supports highway expansion and industry is given a free pass until 2030? In order to create a better future, we need to have a concrete work plan that is fully funded and a specific timeline that clearly... A basic skill learned in school is working together, even if we're frustrated with one another, um, are frustrated with other people, the project or other aspects or of the situation. Yet in many meetings we've had with city officials, adults have shared their frustration about the lack of collaboration between bureaus. As reported in OPB, our city um, continues to struggle to come together to figure out, figure out how to protect and plant trees Yet collaboration between bureaus is vital to the success of this plan and our lives. In Amanda Gorman's poem, Earthrise, she states, reversal of harm and protection of future, so universal should be anything but controversial. 
In 2017, Mayor Wheeler said we're actually going to need to make deliberate steps, deliberate investments, and deliberate policy changes to switch to renewable sources of energy. This plan is not deliberate. If the mayor is serious, and his commitment will show up in the kind of funding and staffing needed to tackle the climate crisis. The Portland Youth Climate Council was created to advise the city council on their climate goals. Like the progress reports we have on the floor, we expect honest uh, and reliable updates to the plan so that we can be a part of our own futures. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have Liam Castles. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and council members. My name is Liam Castles. I use he, they pronouns. I'm 18. I'm an organizer with Sunrise and Portland East Climate Strike. I began organizing late last year because after watching my city fail to take action after years of youth strikes, I knew I had to do something. I'm just barely 18, and the next election will be the first one I can vote in. I will be voting for politicians who choose people over profit. That is what you're voting on today. You're voting on my future and the future of every young person in Portland. Two years ago, I watched my city reach 116 degrees while well, its leaders looked away. Two years ago, I left the state so that the air I was breathing was only 200, an AQI of 200, while well, Portland's leaders looked away. Two years ago, I was blocks away from a fire, fire evacuation warning zone from a forest fire that had reached record temperatures. All this, and it takes two years to even begin voting on whether climate change deserves funding. To young people in Portland, your inaction hits like a truck. It's depressing. It's terrifying. And clapping each other on the back for saying you'll do something about it only adds insult to injury. Last week, an organizer named Ada Crandall asked you to raise your hand if you care about confronting the climate crisis. Your half-hearted attention is what young people remember. You've lost our trust. And if you're not willing to step up, we will demand that you step down. There is no place in Portland for politicians who will not face the issue of the century. I want to be clear that the only way to earn that trust from your community is actual commitment. $2.4 million is a drop in the bucket. The fact that it's an unprecedented amount of funding means You've never spent money on climate change. I'm going to say that again. You've never spent money fighting climate change. This is your opportunity to begin to make change. Adopting and funding the climate emergency declaration fully, because you know as well as I do that partially isn't going to cut it, is an excellent first step. And while it has many issues, it would begin to earn back the young people's trust you've lost by turning your back on climate issues for so long. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you are engaged, and I appreciate it. And you took the time to be here today, and I, I respect that. Sitting behind you are the leaders of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I'm sure they would love to meet with you and walk you through what they have actually done around climate change. Portland has long led in this area. Um, the investments go well beyond just the climate action investments. It gets to the investments we make through the Bureau uh, of Transportation, the Housing Bureau, uh, our economic development agencies. Um, but you're interested. I'd love to see you run for city council someday. Uh, it, it, we need different perspectives and different voices. Uh, you're passionate, and I love that. But really do connect with, with our Bureau uh, come in and talk to them and see what they're doing. I think you'll be more impressed than, than you think you'll yes. be. I, and, I, and I hope that funding becomes more apparent to the youth in this community because it is not at the moment. Thank you. Next up, we have Juliet Stump. Welcome.
Thank you, Mayor Wheeler uh, and commissioners. My name is Juliette Stumpf, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a law professor at Lewis and Clark Law School, but I'm actually here in my capacity as a parent of two teenagers, um, teenagers who are facing um, two very different futures. As a mother, I feel not so much fear for my kids' future, but um, of dread sometimes, and overwhelm, and a sense of denial, of course. Uh, but more and more of determination that I really need to be doing something um, about this crisis, and that's why I'm here. I actually arrived home about four hours ago from a work-related trip to Europe, um, where record heat waves and fires have swept across the landscape. They've ignored borders, triggered evacuations, and have been challenging public systems um, that are not meant uh, to handle that sort of thing. We've been there, and we know what that's like. As a member of this nation, I see our national leaders failing to take the votes that they need to take the uh, climate action that, that President Biden has, um, has laid out. Um, Short-term economic interests are winning out over long-term um, catastrophic uh, harm. And I believe, actually, that what will make the most difference for our kids is powerful local action. Portland has always been a leader in making change, has been um, believed itself to be uh, a city that acts quickly and creatively and powerfully when needed. And, and that's what we need right now. We have an opportunity to make meaningful change uh, on climate change in favor of our, of our kids' future. Actually, 43 steps um, of, of meaningful steps. We have an opportunity when our kids and their kids turn to us in the future and say, what did you do when you knew how harmful climate change was going to be? To say, I acted, I voted. I took the steps that were so critical to making a different future. I think the kids who are speaking out now about climate change, um, the, the concern that they have about what will happen if nothing is done, see really clearly the potential futures that lay uh, ahead of them. They are clear-eyed and determined. They are outspoken and unafraid. They are told that they are inspiring, that they inspire hope. And I think they're really tired of hearing that because we as adults are the ones that hold the levers of change. We're, we are the adults and we're the only ones that can act to head off the future that they had no hand in creating, but that they will inhabit long after we're gone. Our kids are asking us to act like adults and so I ask you to adopt and fund the Portland Climate Emergency Work Plan. I ask you to take the first 43 steps towards a responsible future. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Next up, we have Kathy Tuttle. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council, uh, for giving me this opportunity to testify on Portland's Climate Emergency Work Plan. I am Kathy Tuttle. I live downtown and I'm a land use and transportation planning consultant. Last night, I reread Portland's 2015 Climate Action Plan, which I hope is not entirely obsolete. Uh, hundreds of people spent thousands of hours making over 200 detailed recommendations on goals in the 2015 Climate Plan. They recognized then the urgency of our climate emergency and set benchmarks for 2030. We're halfway now from that 2015 plan to 2030. Goals in the 2015 plan included the number of trees to be planted, charging for driving on busy streets. 25% uh, of all trips should be made by transit by 2030 and 25% by bike in 2030. These were real goals, real timelines. In 2015, Portland did a progress report. Most of the goals from the 2015 plan had not been met, but there was a real sense of urgency in 2017. So now we're in 2022, halfway to 2030, and the climate emergency clock is ticking, and our climate uh, output is leveling off. I want to see numbers. I want to see numbers in this work plan. I want to see timelines. I want to see progress at this halfway point. Portland can write some really good plans. Your plans prioritize people who walk and bike over people who drive, but your actions still do not. Your plans promise housing and safe streets, but so far, I don't see that. This plan, this 2022 Climate Emergency Work Plan, does not 
feel like it has the sense of urgency that carried over from earlier climate plans. It's just another plan. I feel like Portland is climbing up a ladder made of plans, up to a high diving board. Each plan is a rung. Vision zero, climate action, bicycle plan, transit plan, freight plan, housing, waste, parking plan. Each rung of the ladder takes us higher, and now Portland is standing on the high dive board. It has its toes curled around the edge, and we, the people, are still waiting for you to jump. I'd really like you to take a leap into a big, bold future, Portland. It's a climate emergency. Dive in. Dive in. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Our last testifier is Brooke Kavanaugh. Hi, Brooke. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Brooke Kavanaugh. I'm here today as a volunteer with 350PDX. 350PDX has been working to help build the local grassroots climate justice movement for the last nine years. We work to address the causes of the climate crisis through justice-based solutions. I've been here today really to listen and learn more, to understand more about this uh, climate emergency work plan. Um, and I'm also here today <clears throat> to share some support uh, for the plan. I wanna start by sharing appreciation for the work that frontline community-based organizations, BPS staff, and other bureau staff have been doing um, to bring forward climate justice, um, and that is reflected in this plan. And this work plan is a clear effort to make council understand the urgent need to support climate emergency work through funding and policy adoption. And the lack of uh, funding in particular, and I, and I kind of echo Liam about the piddly amount of money, um, it has been a huge obstacle to accelerating climate justice work at the city. So please, it is critical that the council approve these programs and funding requests when they come across your desks from now to 2025. Approving a, res a resolution is not enough. We have to follow through with the support and resources needed to implement them. And I wanna encourage you to keep supporting and expanding the work that centers those on the front lines of the climate crisis, both in process and benefit. It is these community-led solutions that provide the bold vision and actions that are on scale with the climate crisis and systemic injustice. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. And that action, completes please. testimony. Thank, thank you everybody who testified. Um, Commissioner Maps, I think you were first up with questions when we stopped, uh, or would you like to wait? No, I, I'm, I'm glad to start. Uh, I'd love to interact with uh, staff. Um, first, I wanna say uh, thanks to staff for the presentation, uh, and thanks to the members of the public who testified today. I have a handful of questions that I hope that we can dig into. I also recognize we're running late today, so I'll try to keep it brief, and I will not be offended if you keep your responses brief also. Um, I think the first question I'd like to address is, I think this confusion um, around the difference between the Climate Action Plan and the Climate Emergency Work Plan. As I talk to different uh, bureaus and even, frankly, different council offices, I, I think we're still struggling to understand the difference between uh, the old Climate Action Plan and the Climate Emergency Work Plan. And I know you sort of addressed this a little bit. Can you revisit that? Yes, thanks, Commissioner Maps. Donya Oliveira, for the record. Uh, I'll do my best to keep this as concise as possible. The 2015 Climate Action Plan sunset in 2020. Even though the Climate Emergency Declaration set new goals for the city, we didn't actually activate a new Climate Action Plan. This document before you as a part of the resolution is that new Climate Action Plan titled the Climate Emergency Work Plan. It's the work plan to implement the Climate Emergency Declaration. So a follow-up question. That's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I think the change of name um, is uh, maybe has caused some confusion. But, um, so it's not wrong to think of this as just the updated version of the Climate Action Plan, which is how we've been used to. 
the, the long version of that commissioner is that working with our community organizations and our, and our partners, uh, climate action planning is, is, is an older model and we're trying to evolve with our community partners you heard, heard from today about what a climate justice model looks like and leading with the climate emergency was the most appropriate given our evolution as a, as a climate leader. that I, I have, and I think um, I've heard it um, articulated by other members of council today, is um, I'm unclear, does this plan before us today describe all the work that the city is doing in terms of uh, fighting climate change? Absolutely not, Commissioner. In fact, we were hoping to, to frame for you the things that we know that over the next three years, city bureaus will be coming to you all to activate whether in policy, resources, decision points that are gonna be essential to the city. That does not include all the things that we're doing already that, were, that predate this document or the, the work that's being done by, by the private sector, by industry, by, or by community leaders on their own. So a, a much more broader uh, look at that would be much more complicated, a longer document. We wanted to capture what the city of Portland, the capital C city of Portland could do over the next three years. Great. No, yeah. time as a policymaker for the UP and if there was a city place where I could go where we had a comprehensive uh, survey of everything the city's doing. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, I know environmental services is doing things that are uh, consistent with your uh, uh, project but are not uh, discussed um, in this. Um, another question which I'd like to uh, um, raise, and actually members of the public raised this several times today, um, and that has to do with uh, funding the proposals in this uh, uh, document. Um, uh, and can you, fl or how well are these are, are these ideas, uh, like frankly, I don't see any specific uh, funding asking here today yep. the sort of dollar signs. Correct. Uh, where are we in terms of the funding request with this? Are you asking for any particular funding today? N not today, Commissioner. If you treat each one of those items as a distinct project or a, po a policy, the idea is that as a part of the work that that, what, whatever bureau is leading that work, at some point there'll be a decision point that they'll be bringing to council. At that point, if there's a, a funding request, it'd come at that time. This, this proposal is giving you all a snapshot. A, a question that we frequently get was, how much is it gonna cost to implement the climate emergency declaration? And the truth is, that number is, is substantial. It's in, the, it's in the billions when you talk about capital investments. We're not trying to solve for that. What we're trying to do for you today is give a signal to you all about what it would look like for the city of Portland to invest resources and in staff, and perhaps in, in some like more substantial investments to implement those 43 actions. Again, this doesn't isn't comprehensive to say all the capital that's gonna be needed to update uh, private sector buildings or the, the floodplain and doing mitigation banking, you know, examples of just sharing off the cuff. But in this particular plan, we're just giving you a, a, a snapshot of what it would look like to implement each one of those items. I also want to be, be frank is that those numbers may change as we learn more technology evolves, our understanding of the, of the challenges. I say this in candor and also in, in sort of in, in levity, but when you go to a restaurant and you see the, the, the peppers that signify how hot a dish is, sort of look at it like that. We're trying to give you a, a sample of what it would look like relative to the each other project. They're not supposed to be accurate. I wouldn't, uh, please don't hold those to those exact FTE counts, but this is what it would look like, generally speaking, to implement each one of those, whether it be funding just in, in dollars and cents or in people power. Great. Um, I have more questions. I want to create space though no. for my colleagues to get in here and also at the same time. Uh, one of the questions I want to ask uh, refers to a graphic that you showed. Can we pull up, we can let it sit for now, but if, if uh, staff could pull up the graphic that shows the, maybe it's on page five of your presentation, the reduction in carbon over time. We go from 90 to 2000 to 2010 uh, to where we hope to be in 2050. Uh, I'll let you work this on one? that. Um, but this. Yeah, that one. The sort of looks like a map. We have two. One looks like this. Nope. Okay, the one before it. Yep, the one before that, we can pull that up, but I will, while you work on that, I'll let Commissioner Hardesty and whoever else would like to raise a question. You got it. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you again. I think uh, some of Commissioner Mapp's questions, I think, helped clarify some things for me, but let me just say, as an example, T8 uh, uh, under transportation says make freight cleaner. 
there's a lot of dollar signs, and there's fiscal years 22 through uh, 22, 23 through 24, 25. Uh, lots of dollar signs, but I'm not sure what we're going to do in the next three years as the city of Portland to make freight cleaner, right? So. Uh, let me just say, this is a list of, I, maybe, maybe I should ask this question. Is this the 43 uh, things that you think are the lowest hanging fruit that we could actually wrap our arms around and do? <laughs> wrap our arms around, yes. Lowest hanging fruit, no. Meaning we understand each of these sectors and what it's gonna look like to reduce our carbon emissions from such. I would not call some of these actions low-hanging fruit commissioner. In fact, some of the lists are going to be pretty substantial. Thank you. And that, that really was my point. So as I think about uh, adding new restrictions for development, I already hear in my ear from developers about mm -hmm. how that's going to raise the cost of housing at a time that we're in a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I can already see the scenario playing out. What would your response be? If, in fact, we are trying to build housing people can afford to live in, which is rare in the city of Portland today, what would your response be to developers who said, you know, you're going to price this out of the market? Absolutely, Commissioner. So what we laid out in this plan is to signal to our partners, our, our local business community, our industry, this is what it looks like for the city of Portland to get to its net zero target. How we do that is is still largely to be developed with with developers, with our, our housing advocates, with our with our communities at large. So there was, there was an intentionality to not get into the specifics of each of these, not because we don't have ideas, but that's just the city's perspective. If we're gonna do this well and actually implement and, and have like market policies that not just shape our climate emissions reductions, but also hopefully like generate a little wealth and business development, we're gonna do this with community, with, with our business partners. That's the only way this is successful. If it's just the local government trying to jam a policy, we, we know the resistance will be too great and we'll just be spinning in process. We'd like to avoid that. So I, I do have a lot more questions too, just because I'm really geeky about this stuff and I love it and I, and I want us to do good work. Um, and I will certainly have offline conversations around this. But one of the things that I know will happen this year mm -hmm. is we'll get the very first electric fire truck. Yes. Uh, I'm very excited about that. I'm very excited about us testing it out and then figuring out whether or not that is a model that we will expand throughout the city of Portland. Um, fire and rescue is not on your list of, of, of bureaus that are partners in climate mitigation. So as, as, as someone who's buying a new electric fire truck, I just want to know how, how my bureau fits into your vision of what's possible. You want to answer the fire part? Uh, I, we are working really closely with City Fleet and all the bureaus that have fleet um, operations. We're as excited as you are about the electric uh, fire so. truck. <laughs> Maybe not. All right. But pretty excited. I have two staff that work full time on electrification of a fleet along with City Fleet and with Peabot and um, Parks and Water that own a lot of the vehicles. So, um, you know, I, I think we, as Donnie said, there's a lot of things in here uh, that we were just trying to put a fine point on and not capture, not make it a 200 page document. Yeah. Uh, but FIRE is definitely a partner and I've enjoyed working with FIRE over the last several years because they are extremely committed to sustainability and climate. It. Yeah, the example of Fire Station 1 and being a resiliency hub is another great example that fire is leading on climate. And we're also, the city of Portland, uh, not the city itself, but uh, one of our local waste haulers is getting the, you know, a, a electric garbage truck coming along really t you know, soon, and that'll be a, a prototype to see how it works uh, within like the, the system so we can ideally uh, scale that up. So there's a lot of emerging prototypes and, uh, that we're looking forward to scaling. I'm going to end with just saying I really appreciate the work and the thought that you've both put into uh, this climate uh, emergency resolution. Um, and I would just encourage when you come back that we're prioritizing equity and climate justice um, and, and your proposals and because I will be looking to see how this connects to not exacerbating the inequities that we already have. And so, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Maps. Uh, I took my hand down and uh, Commissioner Ryan. Commissioner Ryan. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Hey, I'm, what I'm trying to do is connect the dots between this item and the next item. So, oh, I'm trying to connect the dots between the item that's before us at this moment 
and then the piece theft item that's next. And, sorry, and I didn't catch that, Commissioner. Sorry. Is my mic not working? No. How close are you to it? They're just not aware that we that we're taking. So the Portland Clean Energy oh, Fund oh, PCF allocation of 121 million dollars that was supposed to happen this morning isn't happening until after this. That, in, so in that's what he's referring to. Yeah. So, Commissioner, in the in the plan, we do highlight some but examples. I, but I haven't oh. even asked the so, question. Oh, sorry. But maybe sorry. you know what I. No, no, please. Trying to help please, me. Please. Out. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is gonna be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm up to a great start. Um, like so here's what's up. So you know I've been having dialogue with you about the yeah. fact that we don't have metrics that I wish we had for PCEF and mm -hmm. that it would be a better practice when one's turning in a grant proposal that they could identify with where they're targeting their impact. And what I'm enjoying about this handout is, and it's this one, mm -hmm. is that the one that was just up? Yeah. It, is you break it down into buckets buildings, transportation, electrical supply. So I'm trying to also, perhaps you all hang out with each other, so there, where, where, where can we have efficiencies between the two? And are you having dialogue about that? Yeah, the short answer, Commissioner, is absolutely. <laughs> and I, I wanna just you know, reiterate that the Portland Clean Energy Fund, is, its goals of carbon reductions is directly centered on the city's target of net zero by 2050 and the pathways that are outlined in here. Uh, we give a couple of examples where PCEF programming is already, you know, going to be a key partner and resource for achieving some of these actions. And uh, we're confident that as we continue to develop the, the climate emergency work plan in concert with PCEF's program and as we evolve that structure, we'll be able to, to bright line more specifics on what that's going to look like, whether it be in resiliency efforts, investing in tree canopy, et cetera. So my, my hope and trust is that the work plan is just the foundation and PCEF will continue to build off of what we know about what we need to do to get to uh, net zero. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. It just builds more efficiency and we're building capacity and you're all working together for the same goal, which is clean air, clean water. Uh, oh, I know, is a term that you use. And in this job, I realize I hear terms that become normal to me, but I don't think they are to everyone. So just to, just define circular economy for those people that are listening to the channel, whatever this is. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. So the, the concept of a circular economy is that we, we don't treat our our byproducts as waste, and we start to look how we identify our end game products as places that can be put back into the to our technological systems, our people systems, even um, everything from like food waste to industrial systems that could be um, fed. Uh, without spoiling too much of a future presentation that this council will receive on the clean industry hub, um, what does it look like when we invest in industry sectors that are are symbiotic in nature and have the ability to actually not just um, like feed off of feedstocks and, and waste systems, but also inform and be uh, find efficiencies in everything from energy use, you know, heat capture, um, sharing of of resources in that way. So, uh, on a broader scope, it looks like how do we ensure that um, we have a a future that's that's not predicated on waste, but on on you know, on reuse and repair and resource. Well done. I appreciate hearing that. Yeah. yeah. And then I think I know the answer to this question. I don't know if I like it, but I want to just put it out to the public record. So the next item, we will be talking about awards, and they're all from a certain sector for the most part, right, the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. And then we hear testimony that says we're not putting enough money into this. You know what's coming. Okay. And so I think what the community wants, of course, is the outcomes, because we heard that in the testimony. Mm -hmm. And so is there an opportunity for us to think out of the box on, on um, taking the investments from PCEF mm -hmm. and looking at some of the targeted goals that we have here? Internally, yeah. since we, we only, you know, this is money and where will we put those precious resources? I, I would offer that there are certainly opportunities for us to leverage Bureau work plans and their strategic goals and initiatives and how we leverage those capital improvement opportunities <coughs> with PCEF. So how do we sort of accelerate implementation, utilizing PCEF dollars, ensuring that community is still benefiting and is, and is guiding that conversation, but leveraging, for example, and I'm using this because it's a conversation that keeps coming up, but I want to acknowledge that as the city looks to accelerate our urban, urban canopy and, and our urban forest uh, proposals, how does PCEF play a role on that? Um, and ensuring that we uh, get the trees to the place that need them most. And yeah, I think this is going to take obviously an all-in cross-sector approach. Yes. So just trying to connect those yes. dots on how we do that. 
Yeah. And so I'm trying to think out of the box with you right now. Yeah. And, and I know that and, I've had people ask me those questions, so. Yeah, yeah. And, and Commissioner, we are too when it comes to looking at PCEF going forward. Like, what are the structural strategies that we can uh, implement to ensure that we're meeting our climate goals and still staying true to the intent of the program? I thought it was a very good presentation and I really enjoyed the testimony and I just couldn't help knowing that we have these two items back to back now this afternoon, that it was an opportunity to connect the dots. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Back to uh, Commissioner Maps, then Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you. I'll try. I, I think I have three quick questions. Uh, can we go to the now or never slide? Oh. All right. Uh, people can see it. Um, I, I'm wondering if uh, uh, staff could explain some of the patterns that we've seen in the past. So, for example, between 2000 and roughly 2005, we saw a really dramatic uh, decrease in the amount of carbon that we're putting out in the air. Basically, that slope is the slope that we want to be on. You know, what were we doing right during that 15-year period? And then there's this frankly awkward moment, uh, which kind of rough, roughly maps onto our last climate action plan uh, from 2005 to 2020, where when our progress kind of stalled. Uh, and w what changed, what were we doing right in 2000, between 2000 and 2005, 2005, let's say, why did we stall, and then why did we stall out? A lot of the variability over the last 10 years has to do with actually weather patterns and low and high hydro years. So when we have low hydro, we have to use a lot more of other sources of power that create more emissions. Um, and generally what's happened is that our per person emissions have continued to go down because we keep decarbonizing our energy, our electricity systems, but we've welcomed many, many more people. So even though our per person emissions are going down, we just have more people here, more driving specifically, um, and that's why we've plateaued. Is the weather going to change, or are we going to get more? I got a dam too, so I have this exact problem. <laughs> I'm not going to predict the weather. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and so, the, the, our recent stalling out is actually li literally a kind of a, a, an ironic side effect of climate change. Is that the claim? Yes. Partly, yes. And I, I do think we've stalled out a little bit on on advanced policies. I mean, Portland used to be in the top ten of of uh, cities, usually in the top five around energy, specifically energy policy, and we haven't had a big energy policy since 2016, so we're just losing ground a little bit um, in terms of our advanced policy. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, is it possible to advance to the next slide, uh, Portland's pathway to zero carbon 2050? I'm just gonna ask two questions here, and then um, just the wedge, that one right there. Um, so if I understand this graphic uh, correctly, it basically contrasts what we expect to happen with carbon emissions if we do nothing, which will still kind of go down, versus uh, what we expect to happen if we, um, if we um, implement the policies that are c contained in this plan and other plans in the future. A huge hunk of this comes from transportation, and then when you kind of look under the hood of your transportation policies, that seems to fall into two buckets, kind of moving towards electric cars and then moving towards uh, behavioral change. Um, and I can see electric cars and new new mixes of fuels sort of coming online. That's pretty straightforward. But it seems like a lot of the behavioral changes in terms of transportation um, deal with things like public, getting people to ride the bus, frankly, again. And um, in our presentation, I didn't really hear much about TriMet or some of our other you know, the, the front ferry people showed up today, which which was great. Are we coordinating with TriMet and other folks who run public transportation? Yeah. Well, in terms of this plan? Yes, Commissioner. So, you know, we'll acknowledge that uh, we look to uh, Director Warner and his team when it comes to transportation and mode shift in particular. So we're talking about getting people out of cars into, into transit or, or active mobility like um, options. Uh, but of course, when we're talking about uh, meeting our, our climate goals, TriMet is going to be an integral player in that. Uh, the, the availability, the safety, the credibility, and, and the sophistication of our transit system is going to be essential to ensure that more people get on the bus or, or are on the max. So, yes, yeah, Trayman is going to be a, an integral part uh, partner in this. Great, thank yeah. you. I got one last question. Oh, Chris, oh, Chris is here. Sorry. Oh, hey, Thanks. Chris. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, can, I can be quick. No, we're 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 working. Um, uh, hand in glove with TriMed, particularly on the Division Transit project, which will be launching later this 
year and the Rose Lane project particularly. And people aren't going to ride transit if it isn't fast and predictable. So uh, we've been reallocating um, city right of way in order to make um, uh, transit move more quickly. So to answer your question, yes, we are working with them. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I'd love to learn more about that. That frankly, the behavioral changes around transportation strike me as being one of the really heavy lifts uh, that's contained in this plan. Uh, and director, the last question I have today will go to you. Um, uh, here, I, I think I just want to focus in on the climate redu uh, carbon reduction changes that we hope to see in the short term between now and 2030. But half of that, and our goal here is to reduce our carbon uh, output in half um, in the next eight years, which sounds awfully aggressive to me, which is, you know. We're starting from negative 20-ish though, right? So negative 20 to negative 50. Right. Okay. I think uh, I think I'm tracking. And if I can use this graphic as a sort of guide, it looks like about half of those reductions will come in the space of electric supply in buildings. Um, and then when I kind of go and map this on to who's responsible for um, delivering uh, policy reforms around electric supply in buildings uh, over the next eight years or so, pretty much it's all you. Uh, uh, um, it's all you in PCEF. Um, and uh, which is, you know, uh, um, it's a, a, an awesome responsibility. It's a awfully heavy lift. And, and director, uh, um, I think my last question to you is just if you feel like you have the resources and support you need to uh, accomplish this uh, um, very important, but frankly, um, very ambitious goal. Wow. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, the, uh, the short answer is, uh, I have to believe that we can do it, because if, if we don't do it in Portland, it, it, there's few places that can. But, but the good news is, is that people like Andrea Jacob and her team are, have been working on this for a long time. These aren't wishful um, you know, plans that we hope that we can deliver on. They're strategies that are they're already in play. We've, uh, Andrea and, and Commissioner Rubio mentioned the Build Shift program. We've been working with partners to address these. So when you, uh, when council gets to hear these uh, later this fall and into next year, you'll see some really complex um, proposals that will address this. Uh, yes, are there other actors at play that are gonna be um, integral in success? Of course, but every climate action we have listed here requires some level of participation from others. So I guess really it's about, it's about that bridge building and that's what Portland's good at, right? Uh, to ensure that we have the right partners at the table to get these things across the finish line. I would say that that's, it's doable because we see a pathway to get there. Uh, thank you, and I want to uh, uh, um, thank your whole team for the presentation that we saw today. Um, in the interest of time, I, I could keep you here all night, but I won't. Uh, and in fact, I think I will stop asking questions for today. And I think we, uh, um, I'll hand it over to Commissioner Hardesty, maybe. Yeah, Commissioner or... Hardesty, did you have follow-up questions? I'll go ahead and jump in. I've got a couple of my own. Um, first of all, uh, I think there's, well, for, let me step back. Thank you. This is great work. Uh, I appreciate it. And, and I'll, I, I very much look forward to supporting it. So thank you for that, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, with that said, we have some strategic advantages that we should really leverage in this city. One of them is around autonomous and linked to vehicles. And we talked about that a lot a few years ago as we tried to make Portland a center for both research and the development of autonomous and linked vehicles. And we have, in fact, the largest manufacturer of freight vehicles, zero emissions freight vehicles, located right here in the city of Portland. And so Commissioner Hardesty asked, well, how can we realistically make a difference around reducing emissions in freight? Well, we have the nation's leading expert, in fact, one of the global leading experts on that subject right here in the city of Portland. We should be working with them on that front. Yes. Uh, number two, just a general thought as I read through all of the recommendations, sometimes I feel like we're overthinking some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, it is a heavy lift to ask private sector developers to provide EV charging stations it will only be accessible to the individual who purchases or rents a particular unit. That is not a cost-effective strategy. Uh, and it requires you to overcome some of the obstacles that Commissioner Hardesty identified around the cost of housing. Instead, the public sector should take it upon ourselves to use 
our right of way yep. to provide publicly accessible EV charging. And so I, I and to me that's low hanging fruit. And I realize we have to work with the utilities, but they have federal funding and support to actually help us mm -hmm. to be able to achieve that goal. So rather than go down the rabbit's hole of trying to put a new zoning code into place, which will take us years uh, and uh, overcome withering opposition to help whoever happens to rent or purchase a condo, assuming they have an EV in the pers first place, um, that does not strike me as, as low-hanging fruit, if we're going to use that analogy, yeah. as us committing to a certain number of, uh, hopefully a large number of publicly accessible high-velocity charging stations. Uh, other communities, in speaking with mayors from around the country, what they're figuring out is one of the main impediments to charging is people are afraid that they're going to run out of juice. Yes. And it's not as much a battery problem as it is a psychological problem that people need to overcome. If I drive to the mountain or if I go to Mount Hood or if I go to the beach, am I going to be able to get there, tool around, and get back before I run out of juice? Well, the answer is we should be working with communities around the state. We should identify where do people actually go? Where are they most likely to go? Obviously, across the river, uh, you know, the, up and down the, the, the I-5 corridor. And you guys are already working on, on part of a national network of these things on the I-5 corridor. But what about other places in the state of Oregon where people tend to go? Could we help subsidize uh, in the Mount Hood area, uh, at the beach, wherever? I'm just making this stuff up on the fly. Pick your favorite spot. Um, that's an area where, where I think we could make some immediate uh, efforts. Uh, heat resilience, I, I just want to somewhat uh, point out that we're terrible. You know, I, I, nobody likes a, a snow job from politicians these days. Nobody wants to hear us say how great we're doing. Um, this is the opposite environment for that. This is a time for introspection, and it's a time for us to let people express their anger and frustrations, uh, which is what I do professionally for a living, by the way. Um, but. There are things we do that it always surprises me that even activists in the community don't know about. Yes. Um, we were struck deeply by the deaths last year as a result of Portland reaching the longest streak of over 100 days in its history, including 116 degrees one day in downtown Portland, Oregon, something I never thought would happen in my lifetime. If somebody said, what are the odds? I would have said exactly zero. No chance, none, zippity doo da. Um, yet it happened. And the city actually jumped quickly with the county and others at the state to immediately come up with strategies to make sure that we did not have that loss of life again. And Jana, who I think is still on the horn here somewhere in, in virtual land, uh, Papa Ethem, Ethemio, Jana. Um, she came up with a really comprehensive list, and, and, and I don't want to lose sight of that fact. And uh, maybe this is a good time, John, if you're still out there cursing me because I can't pronounce your last name correctly, and I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I think you did exceptional work, and maybe it's time for us to put that out again with some of the updates that we've included since then, the work that's been done uh, around the public sector. Um, none of this works well in the transportation sector without a good public transit system. And I mean no disrespect to our colleagues at TriMet. Most of them are the inheritors of a system that they know needs lots and lots of work. Uh, but when we say we're special, we can't possibly mean public transit. Um, and that's not to say there aren't really good parts of our transit system, nor is that to say there aren't some really phenomenal projects in the pipeline. Uh, you mentioned Division Street. That's just one of several, I think, really, really potentially game-changing public transit uh, opportunities in our community. But people aren't going to give up their cars if they don't think that there is a reliable public transit system. And in cities where you can't have cars, people don't miss their cars because they have really good public transit. And I've lived in three cities that have really good public transit, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. And it's the opposite of wanting to own a car 
in any of those three cities. The cost does not outweigh, or the benefits just don't outweigh the cost in a city where public transit is ubiquitous. And that should be our goal, uh, but we don't do transit here, but we do need to work with TriMet and figure out how do we fast track their efforts. And I, I think it was two years ago we saw some sort of a study that, that was like a hundred year plan right, right, right. To, to get us yeah. to where we need to be on public transit. That's not inspiring. And, and it doesn't feel like it's listening to, to the urgency of the situation. Um, but I'm not dumping this all on TriMet. In other cities, the city is responsible for public transit. And yep. we should be figuring out, okay, what do you do? How do we help? What's our role in all of this too? Um, so that's, that's just a thought. Um, I don't think we should be telling the private sector how to make their buildings more energy resilient when so many of ours are absolute crap. Correct. Um, I, it, it just it doesn't sit well with me. If we're not willing to lead by example, it seems really, really egregious uh, for us to tell others yeah. that, that they need to do better. I mean, I've been through some of our buildings, and I don't understand why our employees are even working in them from a safety perspective, much less an energy efficiency perspective. Um, so maybe we should start with a plan to address our own uh, internal issues here, and then we can serve as an example and have a, a stronger bully pulpit. Uh, air quality, um, yeah, this this is one where we need to do better. You know, the, the, the criticisms here are justifiable, justified. When people come to the microphone and they say we need to do better around air quality, I, I can't believe we're still having the conversation around air quality. Um, and I realize that what happened a few years ago um, that, that literally originated somewhere else and drifted here, but it became a very real and serious public health threat to our community. That buys us a seat at the table. Yeah. And forest management practices have a lot to do with that. And we can't just put it on our congressional delegation to be responsible for that. We have a say in that. Uh, because we are unfortunately in an area where if the smoke comes, it's gonna settle and it's gonna concentrate and the particulates will be potentially deadly to a subsector of the population and bad for all of us. Uh, I think I'm done. Oh, uh, so walking and biking, um, this to me is, is the, the, the lowest of the low hanging fruit. People like to walk and they like to bike, but they won't do it if they think it's dangerous yes. because they're rational. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I hope we keep prioritizing safety projects. And we talked about a really good one just this morning. Mm -hmm. um, but it, in everything we do around transportation and everything we do around development and everything we do uh, in the business districts and everything we do in our neighborhoods, we need to talk about how how does this present as a place for people to walk and to bike? And I think that Commissioner Maps, although it, it, it probably doesn't register on the carbon chart you were referring to earlier, I think it is part of the reason why there is a perception that Portland has fallen out of the leadership on some of this, this client resiliency. I, I don't think we've been as diligent around active transportation as we should be. And we heard a few weeks ago, some people came forward and said, look, at a minimum, you guys up here need to talk about it more and you need to advocate more and you need to get on your bikes and you need to walk. And that's a challenge I'm, I'm extremely happy to take up, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I already do it and I look forward to it and on days like this. I wish I was doing it right now. Um, but w we have to really think about the safety component for everyone. Um, so I will shut up now. Um, uh, one last thing, just the, the circular economy, I was really pleased that that question came up. Portland was actually a leader on the notion of the circular economy, and I, I was actually very, very pleased to be able to speak on this at a C40 conference, I think it was like four, five years ago mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah. And, um, People look to this city still for, for strategic leadership on some of these ideas. And I realize it's a concept. It's, it's not even a plan. But it is built into this one, and I was really pleased to see it. And I just wanted to highlight it. that as an area where the, the city of Portland, I think, really is being evangelical and helping to lead the charge. And, and that's all you. 
and I, I really appreciate it and I respect it. So I'll stop there, but I just those were just random thoughts I had as I was listening to people testify today. Thank you, Mayor. Hardesty, then Rubio. Ooh, what a day we've had here at council. Uh, you know, uh, this is a fabulous conversation that we're having, and I really appreciate many of the ideas that the mayor just laid out on the table, because as you were presenting this plan, I started thinking about how do we make the private sector jealous that government is moving head and shoulders past them when it comes to addressing climate change, right? I've had many conversations with Sam Barrasso and his team around... 82nd Avenue is a great example. As most people know, with the transfer of 82nd Avenue to the city of Portland, we had the opportunity to really rethink a major thoroughfare in the city of Portland. And so when I'm dreaming big at night about what 82nd Avenue could look like when a development is done, I see an electric grid that's been built uh, that actually is accessible for both electric cars owned and operated by a community-based organization that would compete with Lyft and Uber, um, but it would actually be, the money would stay in our local community. I see opportunities for more electric bikes uh, in East Portland. I see the opportunity for 82nd Avenue to be one of the most climate resilient transportation modes in the city of Portland. And I suspect if we do this right at the front end, we will have private sector folks banging down our doors trying to partner with us and actually do something that adds value to that. You know, I think we have the opportunity to really be the climate leader that we used to be, and we could actually do it in a way. If I think about all the transportation projects that we are coming down the pike in the next 10 years, we have significant opportunity to have a huge impact. But I want to caution my colleagues, it must be in partnership with community-based organizations. They must be the leaders in any dollars coming out of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And if they like the fact that we are committed partners, I see an opportunity for us to do some great stuff. And so I agree with the mayor that maybe as you're refining this document and moving forward, we should be prioritizing what the city has control over that the city can do prior to us going out trying to entice others. Uh, uh, but I think if we are actually putting these big pieces in place, the private sector will be beating down our door, especially the utilities, because once they find out we'll have more people less relying on utilities mm -hmm. and have more independence around their utility uses, they will want to be good partners and trying to figure out how they can help with this transition, right? So I am, unlike maybe some folks on the council, I'm really giddy about the potential for us to really, over the next five to 10 years, actually make major uh, investments that we will see for generations to come. So, you know, and maybe it's just because I'm always optimistic, but this plan actually just helps me think about a lot of stuff that I've been talking to Sam Barrasso about and community-based organizations. So I look forward to working with you, and whatever I can do to help you remove barriers and the barriers I control, you got it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio, you get the last. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I, I, just in closing, I just really want to thank Director Oliveira and the MBPS for their leadership on this presentation today. But in particular, I want to give a huge appreciation to Andrea Jacob uh, for her deep commitment and uh, to this really important work. Um, Andrea is exactly the right person that we need to be leading this effort. And I deeply appreciate the leadership, the thoughtfulness, and the values that she brings to this work. And our city is very lucky to have you, Andrea. So thank you. Thank you, yeah. Commissioner. Um, also, I want to thank all the bureaus uh, for their participation and engagement with the planning and the work ahead. Um, and as we've heard, the city's climate work does not reside in one bureau. We have a lot of work ahead, and it will take real substantive action from all of us to make the consequential changes that we need for Portland and for our families and for future generations. Um, so we look forward to um, continuing to see how this unfolds. and. Um, 
uh, look forward to the collaboration with my colleagues and all of our external and internal partners. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Colleagues, this is a resolution. Any further business? Keelan, please call the roll. Artisty. Commissioner uh, Rubio, thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to move forward um, our climate uh, our emergency declaration and our climate uh, justice work plan. I am very grateful for your leadership and a fabulous team that you have surrounded yourself with. I look forward to us be, uh, continuing to refine and address the issues uh, that we need to address. I want to give a special shout out to Sunrise Movement, Verde, and the Street Trust because they have been good partners, no matter how frustrated they get with us at times, in helping us actually move these projects forward, <laughs> this vision forward. And I just want to make sure that I continue to thank these fabulous young people. I was not at 14, 15, 16 year olds even aware there was a climate, right? So I want to really appreciate their commitment to us doing the right thing. I'm very happy to vote aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for bringing this item forward. I want to thank staff for all the hard work they've done on this important project. And I want to thank the public for all the testimony that we heard today. Uh, this item could not be uh, more timely or more important. Um, you know, it was a little more than a year ago when Portlanders were sitting underneath a heat dome where the temperatures reached 117 degrees and we saw 72 of our friends and neighbors uh, die from heat related stress. And of course, uh, yesterday in Europe, uh, Western Europe, we saw London see highs of 104 degrees. Paris reached highs of 104 degrees. Uh, literally today, all across Western Europe, we have tens of thousands of literal climate refugees who are um, fleeing their homes because of forest fires. And we also know that uh, the United States is not immune from the ill effects of climate change. I believe uh, today, we have about 100 million uh, people in these United States uh, who are under some form of excessive heat warning or heat advisory. Um, and uh, frankly, we have not even reached the um, uh, um, hottest part of the summer. All of that just underscores how important uh, um, this work is. Um, I am um, deeply sympathetic to uh, folks who uh, say that this plan is important, but it doesn't go far uh, um, enough. I suspect that everyone on, on this council um, agrees with that sentiment. At the same time, I also really want to applaud you. I think that the uh, um, goals that you've set, especially for the short term, are um, incredibly ambitious. Um, I, we hope uh, um, in my bureaus we will partner with you to reach these goals, and I um, am confident that the rest of my colleagues on council um, and every city employee will uh, row in the same direction with you. Uh, um, I'm glad to see this work move forward, and for these reasons, I vote aye. Ryan. Nope, sorry, Rubio. <laughs> um, I want to again thank, say thanks to the BPS team for their stellar work. That um, that is just one part of a broad effort to get us to net zero. Um, I also want to thank um, the young activists, dedicated city staff, hundreds of community members who have testified, emailed, called, mailed in their thoughts um, about uh, about climate justice and about uh, pushing us to take action. Um, we hear you and we're committed to doing this. Um, and I also just uh, wanna thank my colleagues for, for the wonderful dialogues that we have and also for um, your openness and your vision for um, a very sustainable and just Portland. Um, and for that reason, I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Rubio, for your leadership. Thank you, Director Oliveira. Um, it's very refreshing to have this, uh, to have you at the table today with Andrea Jacob. You're definitely in the right job at the right time. I know you said it's been going on for a while, but clearly it's been evolving. And I really appreciate listening to the cross-sector inclusion. It was really obvious that you're not in a bubble here. <clears throat> and also with the external partners. And that was also demonstrated by the testimony today. Uh, I, I really have accepted now for a while that we're living through a human-made climate emergency. And that's exactly my point. Um, we're, we need to live through this nightmare that our predecessors um, created, some of them not knowing they were creating it. And the goal is to ensure now safety and sustainability for all Portlanders. I'm really proud 
then we're going to act with some urgency. I was hearing that, and I think the, I actually think the language change was smart, and I think it actually uh, is poignant. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the elephant in the room. It's, it's news today out of Washington. The federal government is really failing to act on this crisis. Um, you know, 50 Republicans and one Democrat, the gentleman from West Virginia. Um, anyway, it's, it's just they prevent a climate action on a federal scale. And I think just today we found out the better Joe um, still hasn't declared a climate emergency. And so it's just the scale of, and the scale of destruction that we're all reading about in Europe right now, it, it's just so poignant that we're having this conversation today. So <clears throat> although it is a global crisis, all we can do is what is our direct action that we can take. And I thought I could tell that, I know you're using the word, the word low hanging fruit, you could tell you looked at impact and influence and control, and I think that you made some really wise decisions. So I could tell a lot of work went into that. Um, I will not read all of this because it's been a long day. Um, let me go down to the bottom to say, I just want to again thank all the 10 bureaus that were included in this work. And I look forward to the updates. And I'm really excited again that this is an inclusive effort. And I vote aye. I feel like there's something that's happening here that is worth Wheeler. Yeah. Sorry, there's always something happening. <laughs> so I'm reminded of my favorite quote, which was by Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, planning is everything, plans are nothing. And that's the case here. Planning is incredibly important. This is our opportunity to come together to highlight some of our priorities. I think you did a great job. I, I'm very pleased with this work. Commissioner Rubio, uh, I, I think it's exceptional. Um, but it's a plan, right? And uh, a plan is only good if it's executed upon. And I think we heard a lot of that today, both from the council as well as staff, as well as from those who are testifying. Uh, so it's a good, good step in the right direction, and it continues the great work that you've been doing previously. I'm very happy to support this, as I said before. Uh, you heard all my comments. I won't make them again. Uh, I'm happy to vote aye. The resolution is adopted. Thank you very much for your hard work. Uh, colleagues, um, we have. Uh, pushed uh, 25 minutes past the break time, actually almost an hour past the break time we usually give our closed captioner. Let's please give them a, uh, why don't we say a 15 minute recess uh, to cool off, get a drink and uh, rest their hands. And we will come back here at 4.40 p.m. Uh, Keelan, before we unplug, I have a question. Uh, tomorrow afternoon's item is being pulled back to office, and it's the only one on the agenda. Do we need to announce that today, or, or what do we do about that, since it's the only item on the agenda tomorrow? Right, right. So yeah, it's already been noticed on the agenda that the item is being postponed to August 24th. Um, OK. I believe, yeah. I believe. So there's no further action needed on that. I OK, think. good. We'll, we'll come back and do the Clean Energy Fund in 15 minutes. We are in recess. Um.
So, um, on behalf of a entirely and really excited council, um, I, I take some shared responsibility with you, Mayor, um, uh, that we were not supposed we were not supposed to vote on the next item or the last item. Um, so, I offer a motion, uh, and, and the purpose is to keep the record open because we still want to talk to community and take uh, input from stakeholders, et cetera, on this plan. And that was the plan to do that, and we were just overcome with excitement. So um, I offer a motion to rescind the last vote and keep the record. Oh, I'm sorry? A motion for reconsideration. Thank you. I offer a motion for reconsideration to rescind the last vote and keep the record open until this item comes back to council on August 24th. I second. second. Commissioner Hardesty seconds. And we'll have a time certain. Is that correct? We will have a time certain on the 24th. We're still working out the time. Okay. okay, and we'll we'll make that announcement in a few minutes. But just for the record, then, um, we're going to take a vote to bring back item 656, which is adopt the climate emergency work plan 2022 through 26 as Portland's climate action plan. The record will remain open, meaning people can look at the plan, send us emails, send us input. We're very interested in what people have to say about it. Uh, you will have till the 24th of August to be able to provide that feedback to the council and we'll tell you exactly what time that that will be heard on the 24th here at City Hall. Uh, as soon as we have that, we should have that in the next few minutes and we'll make that announcement. Mayor. Discussion, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a, a, a process question. So we come back on August 24th, are we taking public testimony that day? No, uh, we're keeping the written record open until August 24th. Today was the day to provide oral testimony, but we're happy to receive written testimony up until that time. And I'm getting a thumbs up from, good, from staff. Terrific. Uh, any further questions? Please call the roll. Hardesty? Aye. Maps? Aye. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. The motion for reconsideration passes, thank you. And we'll get you all the time certain uh, for August 24th. Which brings us back to our morning agenda. <laughs> we will now go back to item number, here we are, uh, item 655 please, a non-emergency ordinance. Authorized grants from the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund for total amount not to exceed $121,964,895. Uh, and just a correction for the record, this is actually a second reading. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, colleagues, last week you heard from PSEF leadership, the BPS staff, and community on the great work that this fund is doing. We've become a global model on what local governments can do to address climate change with communities that have been and continue to be historically impacted by climate change and significantly, significantly under-resourced. But I also want to repeat something I've said before. We can both immediately invest in climate resiliency and carefully develop a responsive, accountable program. These are not mutually ex exclusive goals. Last week's presentation made that clear. So while I'm proud to support these recommendations today, I'm also proud that PSEF staff will be coming before us in the next several months with recommendations to further strengthen the program's accountability and transparency above and beyond what they shared with you last week. This has required significant work by PSEF staff and committee members, and I want to thank them for their hard work and their responsiveness to the questions and the concerns that have been presented. In addition, I'm going to take a few more moments to highlight a clause in this ordinance that represents our further due diligence efforts to ensure this program's success. These efforts are about both protecting public funds and the program's integrity, given the, the, this round of applications is, in effect, our first full robust round of grant awards. Per Council Directive Letter E in the ordinance, we have given Director Donnie Oliveira the authority to revoke any grant award before the grant agreement is executed. I, I want to spell out for our Council that that means between today's vote and any agreement being executed and funds leaving the city. 
as the commissioner in charge, I have directed the PSEF staff to carry out further due diligence efforts over the next 45 days, which is approximately Tuesday, September 6, and reporting back to the mayor and commissioners on their findings. For example, some of the additional review may include review, again, proposals that, that mean new and different work for an applicant, including further reference checks with an entity that has worked with an applicant on a project of similar budget size or tangential work and calling references for subcontractors. Also, new organizations that are being fiscally sponsored and also additional reference checks for any organization that is enter, entering a new line of work that is requesting more than two times their prior annual revenues and or that is three years or younger. We want to ask those organizations if they have ever had a contract with the city and pull that reference if they didn't list it in their original application. This is not an all in inclusive list. D Director Oliveira has the ability to add to this list over the 45 period days, um, day period. I want to repeat to my council colleagues that none of these funds will be distributed before the additional review has taken place. And as the directive states, Director Oliveira currently has the authority to revoke any grant award before the grant agreement is executed. Finally, before I hand this back to the mayor to call the vote, I also want to state for the record that this program is going above and beyond what other grant programs do here at the city, and I feel the need to call this out. Uh, for, may, for many reasons, this program is being held to a higher standard in an environment in which bureau staff has been very responsive to information requests from this council. And going forward, it's important that we hold PSEF and all other city grants to the same bar, an equitably applied standard. We, BPS, PSEF team, and my office, and stakeholders and colleagues are all working very hard to manage this new one-of-a-kind program effectively and transparently. We have remained open and nimble, and we, as a city and community, will be better off for our thoughtful approach. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Commissioner Maps. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Rubio, just a clarification. So this isn't an amend. This is you're not forwarding an amendment here. Yeah. This is sort of um, an administrative uh, um, directive. Well, um, okay. Um, thank you. I want to. Um, uh, thank Commissioner Rubio for um, th this due diligence and important oversight here. Um, I, uh, if this were an amendment, um, one of the things that I hope that we could do as uh, the director does uh, his due, dil due diligence here is to collect 990s for the uh, organizations that um, uh, we are that have applied for grants, and uh, it would also be, uh, help, I think, helpful to me, and I suspect for the council, if we could get estimates of um, the amount of carbon we expect to each of these grant projects to re uh, uh, um, take out of our atmosphere. Uh, thank you. And I see Commissioner Hardesty has a response, and Commissioner Rubio too. Uh, Commissioner Rubio, then Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, looks, do you I have a comment, Commissioner Hardesty? Thank you, Mayor. Um, let me just say that if we're going to put additional barriers on grantees because they happen to be community of color members, I would reject that explicitly. We have never once as a city asked for 990s for nonprofits. If anybody wants it, they're readily accessible online. But I would absolutely be appalled if we would put standards in place that we have never put in place for white majority contractors at the city of Portland. Are we going to create two systems here where we are over scrutinizing communities of color and um, just letting white contractors just continue to do whatever <laughs> white contractors are going to do? I think we have to actually set a standard and hold everybody to the same standard and not do something different because there are entities out there that don't want to pay into the Portland Clean Energy Fund and don't want it to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, I'd like to thank Commissioner Rubio and I'd like to thank her team and I would like to thank the Bureau 
uh, for clarifying this important aspect of the project, that, that there is a 45-day period, that there is an opportunity for additional vetting. Uh, I think that is a very reasonable and prudent step to have another stage gate before the funds are actually allocated to individual nonprofits. Uh, and I want to thank you, Director, for being willing to step up uh, and provide that extra stage gate. As, as a city uh, commissioner, as the mayor voting to support this program, I feel um, much more confident knowing that there is still another opportunity to, to vet these programs. And so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that there is that authority within the ordinance. Any further discussion before we call the roll? Seeing none, please call the roll. Hardesty. Sam Barroso, I really appreciate the work that you've done to actually create a program that never existed in the city of Portland before. You have been thoughtful, you've been intentional, you've been inclusive, and I just really appreciate the leadership that you have brought to the Portland Clean Energy Fund, and I thank you for that. Danny, Donnie, you are new on the block, but not new to this issue, not new to the passion that we need to make sure that this Portland Clean Energy Fund lives up to the promises that, we, that, the, that was made to the community. Mm -hmm. I always need to remind folks that if it was left up to the city of Portland, the Portland Clean Energy Fund would not exist. Mm -hmm. It took community-based organizations led by people of color to make the case to the public as to why retailers making a billion dollars a year and a half million dollars in the city of Portland should invest 1% of their resources into climate mitigation that would, especially as uh, to prioritize those communities who traditionally are left out of the economic process. I, I, I'm, I will probably say this every time the Portland Clean Energy Fund comes in front of this council because there seems to be an organized effort to discredit the Portland Clean Energy Fund. This seems to be an organized effort to question every person of color who's getting a contract out of the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And in my short time here on this council, I have to say there are a lot of contracts that come through here that no one ever raises an eyebrow on, that I raise all kind of eyebrows on. And um, I believe that racism is playing a huge role and why every time there's a penny going out on Portland Clean Energy Fund, there's so much scrutiny. I trust the people who are in charge. I trust Commissioner Rubio to provide the appropriate oversight. Um, and you know, it, it, it's actually uh, soul crushing to think the community worked so hard to make this happen. We are now giving out our second full grant uh, cycle and I want to remind us, had we listened to the Portland Business Alliance and some other folks who tried to force us to throw money out the door at the beginning of COVID because we were sitting on money, I want to remind people that it was Sam Barrasso and I that hold, held firm and said, no, the money will not go out until we are clear about where those dollars are going to be invested. I hope the next time we bring the Portland Clean Energy Fund to the city council, that we have less scrutiny because of who the award recipients are, and that we can get people focused on, are we making a change that, the, that this fund is supposed to make? Uh, and I will remind us all again, this is only the second year that we've done these full grants. We did some uh, early, uh, some small planning grants, but this is really the first, the second full funding cycle. Um, and I have to say, as someone who put all my sweat, blood, and tears into both the creation of, the passage of, and then the implementation of the Portland Clean Energy Fund, this feels like racism at its worst every time we talk about this fund. I certainly hope this is the last time that we are going to be challenged. You put some excellent systems in place that we don't have for any other grants at the city of Portland. 
And I just don't want us to every grant cycle be trying to change our process to accommodate people that A, never wanted the Portland Clean Energy Fund to exist, two, don't want to pay into it. Guess what? The voters spoke, you're paying into it, and we will be accountable to those dollars to the public that we serve. I vote aye. Maps. I'd like to thank uh, Commissioner Rubio, PCEF staff and volunteers, uh, and Sam in particular for their work on this important project. Uh, I'm going to vote aye today, um, but I do have some questions about uh, um, both uh, some specific grants and the broader um, policy framework in which these uh, this program is operating in. I think today I don't want to litigate the questions I might have about specific grants. Instead, um, I'd like to continue an ongoing dialogue with uh, planning staff, um, if it's acceptable to Commissioner Rubio and staff. I'll send you a letter uh, um, which um, outlines some questions I still have about some specific grants. Um, if, if you could get back to my office with um, a response in a timely manner, I would uh, very much appreciate that. Um, instead, today I want to focus in on, I think, um, the work ahead of us. And um, I think there are some policy and process questions which um, I look forward to engaging in over the course of this coming months um, as we figure out how to evolve and roll out this program. Uh, and some of those policy questions that um, I'm still struggling with, and I hope that we can um, clarify um, over the next year, include things like what is council's role in this process? You know, we're about to approve uh, $100 million um, in spending spread across, I forget, dozens and dozens uh, of grants. Um, although I have looked at every grant, it, uh, I, I feel like, um, it would somehow be inappropriate um, and unrealistic for me to go and offer specific amendments to each one of these grant proposals. So I don't want to do that. At the same time, the next time we come back, I, I wish there was, I was not quite in this space. I don't know what the solution looks like, but if it's agreeable to Commissioner Rubio, I hope that we can uh, um, figure out a process for clarifying what council's role uh, here is. Um, a second question, and I'm confident that staff will address this. I'm a little bit uncomfortable spending $100 million uh, when we have a fresh auditor's report. Um, I recognize the auditor's report just came out, I think, in April, so you haven't had a lot, uh, um, enough time to really respond to that. But certainly, uh, before we come back here in a year, I hope that we have a chance to um, engage with some of the questions and concerns raised by and reforms uh, proposed by the auditor. Um, uh, another um, clarification, which I would very much uh, um, appreciate, um, is further dialogue and clarification about the interaction between uh, the PCEF program and the climate emergency work plan that we just passed. They clearly um, complement each other. Indeed, I don't see how we're going to achieve uh, many of the objectives that are outlined in the climate emergency plan without the clean energy fund support. Um, I still don't quite understand how these gears mesh though. Um, and the final thing that I sure hope that we uh, see by the time we um, uh, consider the next batch of grants are specific metrics around the outcomes we expect for uh, um, these grants. So, you know, when we give out dollars to uh, decarbonize, it would be great to know uh, how many metric tons of carbon we're going to pull out of the air, how many clean energy jobs we're going to create. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure what metrics for uh, future innovations or regenerative agriculture look like, um, or even sort of planning grants. Uh, um, but having a sense of what we're actually trying to achieve and buy uh, with these dollars would be very helpful uh, to me. Um, None of this is surprising. Uh, you know, this is a brand new innovative program. You know, we expected this to be essentially a small pilot, and it's uh, um, 
because of uh, the vagarities of the economy. It's become much larger than I think any of us expected. There's a lot of responsibility with that, and I think it requires us to tool up in a different way. Um, so this is just what the work is. I do want to uh, compliment Sam in particular and Commissioner Rubio um, for sticking with this and really delivering an impressive package of, package of innovative programs. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this, and uh, for these reasons and more, I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I gave my remarks earlier, but I just want to thank Sam Barrasso for all of his tremendous work, uh, Director Oliveira and the PSEF staff and committee for their tremendous amount of work as well um, to arrive here today. Uh, this represents thousands of hours of work on behalf of our city, and I don't want that to be lost today. Um, and I'm also grateful for the interest and collaborative um, uh, work ahead and that this council will it has and will take in working with the PSEF team as we move forward and looking forward to what Sam and his team bring forward also in this fall later that they've been working on diligently um, since this spring. Uh, these grants are and will continue to change the lives of Portlanders, creating opportunity in confronting our city's systemic racism. And it should make us all proud. And for that reason, I vote aye. Ryan. First, I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for your leadership. Uh, the voters overwhelmingly approved local action for climate justice, as is the case with many big policies, especially one that is a one of a kind that other cities are hoping to copy. We have such a big opportunity and to implement this big challenge. We are creating a new path, and I'm so proud of that as a Portlander. The goal is to meet the intent of the voters' wishes with clear goals and with fiscal efficiency, stewardship, and oversight. That is the duty of this council. Commissioner Ruby, in one year's time, this is vastly improved. The system has really um, been responsive to uh, the many challenges of implementing something big and bold such as this. And it gives me comfort to be supportive of the awards that we are approving today. And I've been clear with all of you that in a year from now, I wouldn't be supportive if we cannot provide the voters with clear community goals that are measurable, that we can be accountable to using their investment towards, in fact, those measurable goals that we come up with. And I know we've had that conversation, and I think I have a lot of trust based on the dialogue that, that will be coming. I really appreciate the dialogue specifically with the two people sitting here, Sam Barrasso and Director Oliveira, and also the PSEP volunteers that have been uh, connecting with our office. The meeting last week revealed a willingness to keep a program updated, to be committed. There was no defensiveness about doing the structural improvements. You listened, and it was respectful. And it was an example of actually really good government. And I look forward to the actions that you take to bring us back in the fall. I look forward to the dialogue that we'll continue to have. I know there'll be some deeper dives. And we're all in this together. And I'm proud of a council that's committed to that. In fact, I'm just so proud to be in a city that's leading, that's innovative, that is actively engaging communities on the ground to build resilience as we focus on long-term survival. You know, Portland needs some wins, and this actually can be one of those. We've been a city that I think has rested on our laurels for too long. We used to be the innovators. I remember that in the 80s and 90s and aughts. And this is an opportunity for us to grab that again and be seen internationally as that city. So I just want to focus on a few of the community partnerships, especially the partnerships between nonprofit organizations and the private sector, particularly where BIPOC-owned businesses are bringing in more energy-efficient housing options to our community. Just have to name a few. The innovative housing, when affordable housing with innovative housing work to restore and expand the housing at the Anna Mann House. That stuck out to me. Proud Ground's work on net zero affordable homes to create net zero home ownership opportunities for moderate and low-income households and the workforce development, construct, constructing hopes, pre-apprenticeship program, building equity, clean energy careers through construction and pre-apprenticeship training. Those are just a few of promising awards that really make me happy to vote in support of this uh, grant today. I think now more than ever, with the current news that's going on, both in Washington and at the heat dome in Europe and the Great Plains, it's such an honor to be voting on something like this in lieu of that. PSEF, again, is a first-of-a-kind local response to a climate crisis. And done right, this is an opportunity for other cities to learn from the city of Portland, the city of Roses. Our city prospers when we are seen as innovators, creators, and entrepreneurs who, need, who we need to be, to be this, to be entrepreneurs who we need to be 
to be the city that we actually want to be. I vote aye. Wheeler. Well, our bosses have been very clear with us, and our bosses are the voters, and they overwhelmingly supported the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And now our responsibility is singular, and that is to make sure that it is as successful as possible. And I take that charge very, very seriously, and I believe my colleagues do as well. I want to acknowledge that the Bureau is coming forward with further refinements and further reforms. I think they're necessary. I look forward to them. And I'm appreciative of uh, the fact that you see the opportunity for improvement. It'll probably be incremental. And over a period of years, this program will continue to be refined. And I will continue to work to make sure that the program is successful as possible. There are three areas I highlighted when we had this conversation last. The first was around the vetting of proposals and then the oversight and management of contracts once the dollars have been extended. And I have put on the table and I'll put on the table again today that I'm open to the idea of a larger percentage of the fund going towards both vetting the proposals on the front side and supporting the management and oversight of contracts on the back side. And that means if there is a political lift to be had there, I will stand with you to do so. Uh, second of all, uh, public input. I think there's large agreement here that it would be desirable to have more public input on the individual grants that are put out there. It's very hard for a city council to do due diligence on dozens of proposals. Uh, but the community writ large probably knows something about every one of these organizations, and that is an opportunity to provide information to us, both from uh, people who are in the Portland community, people who've worked with these nonprofits, members of the media, and others who could bring to bear critical information. Uh, last but not least, I appreciate the substantial efforts that have been made uh, by you, Sam, as well as Donnie and others, around conflict of interest and making sure that we keep conflict of interest as far away from this model as possible. The most impactful testimony came from Robin Wong, who is a member uh, of the Portland Clean Energy Fund Committee. Uh, he is somebody who is familiar with organizational investment. And he laid out a case that I thought was very important. He said, this is not just a grant making fund. This is also a seed fund. And with a fund of this type, which again was overwhelmingly supported by our bosses, with a fund of this type, there is inherent risk. There will be mistakes. There will be dollars that will go to organizations or programs that will not pan out the way that we hope. And my presumption is that the voters understood that when they supported this fund. And so our job is to mitigate that risk as much as possible. And I believe that through vetting uh, and contract oversight, uh, through more public engagement, through strengthening our conflict of interest requirements, I believe that we can mitigate that risk. We cannot eliminate it. The fund was not designed to eliminate risk, just the opposite. It was designed for the fund to take calculated risks to support the overall goals, and I'll continue to support that. Uh, Commissioner Rubio, thank you. Uh, you have proven, again, to be a very good listener and collaborator with all of us. Same, Sam, Donnie, uh, everybody involved in this. Uh, we're learning more and more every day about how to be faithful and effective stewards of a very, very important fund. I'm happy to vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Before we hang up the receiver, uh, we now have a time certain for item 656, which is the climate action plan related uh, in many ways to the discussion we just had. It will be on August 24th, time certain, 1025 AM. So if people want to tune in for that, 
Uh, that'll be August 24th at 10.25 a.m. Uh, we always appreciate your thoughts, your emails. Uh, send them to us directly to the council clerk. We'll read them, and we thank everybody for their input. So unless I've made a terrible mistake, I believe that completes our agenda for the day. Does it not, Keelan? It, it does. Thank you for your service as well as legal counsel. It's been a long day. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>